Hey everyone, welcome to TPUSA Live. I'm John Root and this is going to be the only time you really see me today. I'm off to Florida soon because I am going to mar lago I'm going to our winter gala and I want to send a huge shout out to all our donors and all our supporters, whether you support us financially, watch our videos, like our stuff, share it. We really appreciate you very, very much. You guys are the heartbeat of what we do here at TPUSA Live. But coming up next, we got Human Events Daily with Jack Posovic. He's the guy that has the best connections, the best sources, and the best information and the truth for you every single day. If you haven't subscribed to his podcast, be one of the millions of downloaders for that. Make sure you do that. Leave a nice little review for Jack Posobiec. He'll break down everything that's going on in our crazy world right now. I know there's going to be some more information about the Maxwell trial, that and so much more on Human Events Daily with Jack Posobiec. Like I told you, I'm gone after this, so you got a special guest host. You got the producer of the Charlie Kirk Show, Connor Clegg, is going to be sitting in this seat right here. You probably saw him in the Thanksgiving special. Connor's always entertaining. He definitely knows what he's talking about, and he's got some great information for you, and he's sitting down with some awesome guests. He's going to sit down with TPUSA contributor and host of Smash, MAGA Hulk, Stephen Davis. Christiane Allen is back. She's a TPUSA ambassador, and she also works at Getter. And then TPUSA ambassador and national director of Blexit, Pierre Wilson, is going to be sitting on the couch as well. They'll break down everything that's going on in our world. They're definitely going to have a lot of fun, because you know when Connor Clegg's around, it's a good time. So that's going to be a lot of fun on the couch. Right after that, you got a brand new episode of The Spillover with Alex Clark. The Spillover is another great podcast you got to make sure you subscribe to. Make sure you leave a nice little review for Alex Clark. She's going to sit down with Melissa Odin. She's going to share her experience. She has a crazy, crazy story of how she survived multiple abortion attempts and then was actually left for dead and she talks about how she met her birth mother and her birth mother had no idea that she was alive so a very very intense but shocking and uplifting story so make sure you tune in for the spillover you can also tune in to the spillover on spotify now that spotify has allowed the spillover to be back i guess and also apple podcast so you can check it out there as well and then right after that you're getting some more alex clark in the newest episode of pop politics she's going to share some very disturbing footage right out the right outside of the supreme court of pro-abortion activists it's some weird stuff there she'll break that down also there's some shocking cia cover-ups that alex clark is going to tell you about and then it's Friday, so she's going to share her Freak of the Week, that, and so much more on politics. And I'll tell you this. It's been a great first week of December. I love Christmas time, but Christmas time actually leads to a, a lot of debate. A lot of debate around Christmas movies and what is a Christmas movie. So Alex Clark, she shares her Freak of the Week. She shares her hot takes on Tuesday. I got a hot take on Friday. Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. I know it might rub some of you the wrong way. I know it rubs some people the wrong way in the office here, but I know there's even people right now behind the camera that are giving me a thumbs down. I think Die Hard is just a movie that happens to take place during Christmas. Do you really feel the spirit of Christmas in Die Hard? I don't think so. Like, I wanna see some Santa Claus. I wanna see some Jingle Bells. I wanna see some reindeer, some presents, all that stuff. John McClane, absolute stud. And I'm glad that he's able to save Christmas for uh, his ex-wife's co-workers. But Die Hard, not a Christmas movie. Watch some good Christmas movies, like A Christmas Story. Jingle all the way. Home Alone 1 and 2. There's a lot of other movies that you can be watching during this time. Die Hard, save it for any other time of the year. That is my hot take, but I got to get the heck out of here. Coming up next, we got Human Events Daily with Jack Posobiec. Enjoy, and I'll see you guys on Monday.
if I told you that this has all happened before? The riots, the violence, the church burning, attacks on police, destruction of private property. My name is Sammy Steigman. I am a Holocaust survivor. This is the reality of what happens when you have capitalism that goes to socialism. El socialismo no funciona. El socialismo no funciona. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard today's edition of Human Events Daily. First up, a clinical psychologist describes Epstein's grooming tactics in the Ghislaine Maxwell case. Next, CIA directors for 14 years covered up a series of child sex crimes within Langley. Third, the Waukesha massacre suspect had a six of six risk report when released by the DA, according to new documents. And finally, Jussie Smollett's lawyers claim the judge attacked them and they're asking for a mistrial. All this and more head, Human Events Daily. Truly disgusting stuff coming out of the New York City case, Ghislaine Maxwell, the descriptions of the grooming, the types of operations that were going on. We're not getting a lot about the Epstein network, but one thing that did come out in the trial was that prosecutors brought forward a child psychologist to talk to us about the stages of grooming that are used by people like Epstein and Maxwell in these types of situations. Psychologist Lisa Rocchio, a clinical psychologist, testified that adults who sexually abuse children commonly engage in a process that can be thought of as having five basic steps. One, selecting a victim. Two, obtaining access to and isolating the victim. Three, using lies, deceit, and manipulation to build trust and attachment. Four, desensitizing a victim to physical and sexual touching. And five, maintaining control to coerce the victim into accepting continued abuse. Now, Dr. Rocchio said that the grooming process could include giving gifts, building rapport through expressions of concern, bringing up sexual subjects in conversation, and slowly escalating sexualized physical interactions with prospective victims. So to all parents out there, or to anybody that's involved in any type of organization um, that involves children. These are the types of things you need to look out for. Now, obviously that doesn't mean, look, you, you know, you see somebody give a gift, you see someone being friendly, right? Obviously that doesn't mean that's a person that's conducting grooming. But what you wanna watch out for are these red flags. You wanna watch out for the isolation. You wanna watch out for anybody who's mentioning any of these, you know, sexual or really just adult topics in basic basic conversation with someone who's under age. These are the red flags to watch out for. And as we will see, these are the things that start coming up more and more with Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein as this case continues. But there was also testimony yesterday from Jeffrey Epstein's housekeeper. Now, this guy had not only access to the premises, but access to Epstein's black books. Take a listen. This testimony today showed really how intertwined Maxwell and Epstein's lives were. Right. I think today we got a uh, sort of more of a narrative of exactly how this household ran and what kinds of, uh, you know, visitors they had and how, you know, Epps, uh, Maxwell ran this household. Really, she did the hiring and firing, and she seemed to pull a lot of the strings, even at one point directing uh, employees to complete tasks in a 58-page booklet that she put together. Uh, so we're, you get, we were getting more of a narrative of exactly how this uh, operation ran, right. this, this sex trafficking operation. T today, the defense brought up some inconsistencies in one accuser's testimony. How damaging in your mind? Well, you know, it's very early on. It's only day four of the trial. We still have three other accusers that are going to take the stand. But I think that uh, Maxwell, you know, she she has hired herself a team of really aggressive attorneys. And, and um, one of them who questioned Jane um, was very good at pointing out the inc inconsistencies between the testimony uh, or the information that she gave authorities a year, even a year ago, and how it differed from the testimony that she gave in court on Wednesday. You probably know this case much better than most. 
Was there anything presented in the trial so far that surprised you? I, I think overall, so far anyway, I'm surprised that the evidence or the testimony isn't more damning. Uh, they really haven't, as of yet anyway, um, you know, tied Maxwell they, the, to, to this trafficking. What they've done really is uh, indicted Epstein. And of course, Epstein is dead and they're not going to be able to, to, to punish him. And so I think to some degree, the elephant in the room really is Epstein. And, and most of the victims are saying he's the one that abused them. So I think, you know, they have to, um, you know, with the other victims that are going to take the stamp, perhaps they will provide more yeah. evidence of Maxwell's involvement. Well, that, that actually plays right toward what the defense said from the very beginning. You want to be trying Epstein, but you can't because he's dead. You shouldn't be trying her. Right. And I think that the witness yesterday, because they had she had so many inc inconsistencies, I think that that, that, that played into um, the defense story a little bit. Uh, but as I said, you know, um, and as the case is going on, Daily Mail just hit us with an exclusive last night. Jeffrey Epstein's access to the Clinton White House laid bare. Visital, visitor logs reveal the pedophile visited the former president at least 17 times, including a dozen in 1994, twice in one day on three separate occasions. Visitor logs exclusively revealed by DailyMail.com reveal Jeffrey Epstein visited the White House 17 times during Clinton's first term, 1993 to 1995. These documents were released as part of a FOIA request. The late financier was invited by some of Clinton's most senior advisors and aides, including Robert Rubin, who later served as Clinton's Treasury Secretary. While Epstein's crimes did not become public knowledge until his 2006 arrest, the visits would have occurred around the time his alleged madam, Ghislaine Maxwell, or as we call her, Lady Epstein, was allegedly procuring underage girls for him. This is a question that the Clintons have never significantly answered. President Trump has gone over this again and again. One flight from Palm Beach to New York, when he found out what was going on, he kicked Epstein and banned him from Mar-a-Lago. It's very clear what happened here. But most importantly, it's also very clear that we need more information about these black books and every single person who was involved with this network and at what level. So this next story is one of those ones where you're like, come on, that can't be real. Last segment, we talked all about the Epstein network. This segment, according to new documents that have just been released via FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, to BuzzFeed News, and credit where credit is due, actual documents released to BuzzFeed News, Jason Leopold, CIA files say staffers committed sex crimes involving children. They weren't prosecuted. What does this mean? Directors of the CIA, going all the way back to the President Bush years, under President Bush, President Obama, and on forward, covered up child sex abuse that was going on within the CIA, or at least within CIA officers. Uh, ranks. One employee had sexual contact with a two-year-old and a six-year-old. He was fired. A second employee purchased three sexually explicit videos of young girls, filmed by their mothers. He resigned. A third employee estimated that he had viewed up to, he'd viewed up to 1,400 sexually abusive images of children while on agency assignments, while on CIA, CIA assignments. The records do not say what option, if any, the CIA took against him, a contractor who arranged for sex with an undercover FBI agent posing as a child had his contract revoked. So you remember the CIA, right, folks? This is that organization that's run by John Brennan that was told again and again to us. They said again and again, we just have America's best interests at heart. Remember, 17 intel agencies, 17 intel agencies are all telling us the truth about Trump, the truth about Russia, the truth about white rage, whatever else is going on out there. Listen to John Brennan talking about Russia collusion just a few years ago. I encountered and I'm aware of information and intelligence that um, revealed contacts and interactions between Russian officials and U.S. persons involved in the uh, Trump campaign that um, 
I was concerned about because of known Russian efforts to suborn the, such individuals. And it uh, raised questions in my mind, again, whether or not the Russians were able to gain the cooperation of those individuals. I don't know whether or not such collusion, and that's your term, such collusion existed. I don't know. But I know that there was a sufficient basis of information and intelligence that required further uh, investigation by the Bureau to determine whether or not U.S. persons were actively conspiring, colluding. On April 2010, a special agent, April 8, 2010, contacted the CIA Office of Inspector General regarding agency contractor, name is redacted, advising him that he had gone into an online chat room in an attempt to travel interstate for the purposes of having sex with what he believed to be an underage child. Well, it turns out that the person he was talking to, who was uh, supposedly gonna be this, uh, essentially a groomer for one of these children, was actually an undercover special agent from the FBI using an entrapment operation with this chat room. So the CIA is going into these online chat rooms, I don't even know where you go to find stuff like that, on CIA IP addresses. That means while they're at work. That means while they're at work. So John Brennan, very, very, very concerned with, uh, you know, the dossier, the Steele dossier, which was completely fake, which was completely bogus. But when you have stuff like this, here, here again. One CIA agent admitted to the IG inappropriate sexual contact with one child victim, inappropriate sexual activity with a second child victim, and an examination confirmed he was found to have extensively downloaded child pornography. Folks, I'm not talking about just their home computers. This is on their government computers. Pedophiles. Pentagon, CIA, Langley. So forgive me if I'm not going to immediately jump when you tell me that Russia is hacking the elections. When you've literally got pedophiles sitting behind the keyboards of Langley telling us that they know what's going on around the world and inside our own government. Well, regime and corporate media have all but stopped talking about the Waukesha massacre. But Human Events Daily is not one of those. So we are going to continue talking about it. New documents show that Daryl Brooks was assessed as a 6-6 risk to the public, but the DA let him out anyway due to bail reform and criminal justice reform policies. So if we look at these documents, Milwaukee County Pretrial Risk Assessment Report, PSA assessment date, 11-5-21, November 5th, 2021, just a few days before this horrific attack took place. And I should mention, by the way, that there are still children and parade attendees that are in the ICU in critical condition as we speak today because of this situation. And I've been told that we are putting together um, essentially a, a drive to be able to try to try to raise some funds, raise some support for these families and for these kids. And more to come on that, but we've got something in the works because it is very horrific. And not only should no family ever have to deal with something like that, clearly no family should have to deal with something like that at Christmas time. Six out of six, and it goes through all the different risk factors, red of the red in terms of this. The system, as you know, they used to say this after 9-11, the system was flashing red when it came to this guy. I'm also gonna pull up now, we've got his record. This is someone, by the way, who never should have been out on the street. His mother has come out and said that he was actually getting some kind of uh, mental health treatment. And I gotta tell you, that's something that I've talked about so many times. And I'll mention it again now. We need to reopen inpatient mental health facilities in this country. You cannot have people like this, habitual offenders, whether they're addicts or whether they are people who have mental issues, they cannot just be allowed back out on the street. You're going to lead to more situations like this. We have to get out of, the, of this, this idea, this ridiculous notion 
that you can just prescribe people pharmaceuticals and then put them out on their own and that they're going to be perfectly fine. Look at Kensington, Philadelphia. Look at Waukesha, Wisconsin. This is the situation and you're going to get more Waukeshaws, you're going to get more Kensingtons, you're going to get more San Francisco's the more you continue to do this. You look at this guy's record back to 1999. Aggravated battery, carrying concealed weapon, resisting obstruction, loitering, obstructing an officer, resisting, resisting, receiving stolen property, paternity warrants, strangulation and suffocation, domestic abuse battery, uh, more warrants, more uh, bail jumping, uh, more possession, possession of a firearm as a convicted felon, in use of a firearm in domestic abuse. More paternity warrants, domestic battery, bail jumping, endangering safety. This is the one early November where we were told that he had essentially run over his girlfriend just a few days before this happened. This is a guy that shouldn't have been out on the street, whether it's behind bars or behind an institution's walls where he's getting the care he needs. We need to be better about protecting our people. Even Joe Rogan actually mentioned this, and I'm going to play that out because I appreciate Joe for mentioning this. Give yourself if you a headache. All these steps, if you took all these steps, step one, defund the police. Step one, hire these insane, progressive, air quotes. Crime-loving pr prosecutors. DAs that are letting people off. I, and like the guy in Wisconsin that ran over those 50 people. That guy, they had just, he had tried to run over his girlfriend. Engineered he was out on only $1,000 bail. I he knew. tried to kill somebody with a car. He was out on $1,000 bail, and then he runs over 50 people in a car. Engineered recidivism. And then here's the f***ed up part. The way they're covering that story in the news. It's all about the car. The man, you know, there's, it's not the man who killed those people. It's, the car. it's a, an accident that was caused by an SUV. A f***ing SUV caused an accident? What are you saying? Did it go haywire? Did the, the auto driving feature go nuts and it just plowed into the crowd? No, that this Engineered. evil man with real problems, like a really psycho psychologically human being drove into a crowd of strangers. Now I want to mention as well that if you want to continue supporting us, remember, Twitter is going to start taking down information like this. We put out these records, we put out these documents. Twitter has said if you post private media, they're calling it, you're going to take it down. That's why you've got to go sign up for Getter right now. Get on the lifeboats. It's now or never. They are going to start shutting you down. You saw what Facebook did to Kyle Rittenhouse. You saw what Twitter is going to start doing to people like me, to people like anyone that's just posting true information that they consider uh, essentially harmful to the regime narrative. Get on Getter. Get on the lifeboats. Well, Christmas isn't just coming. Christmas time is here. We are in the Advent season. Uh, for myself, I know Christmas has started because it's December 3rd, and that is my son's sick birthday, AJ. So happy birthday, AJ. But for everybody else out there, you still have time to get your presents. And that means going to MyPillow.com, using promo code POSO, get these special deals in now before the supply chain crisis rocks down on everybody, comes down on everybody. But by the way, they're saying chicken tenders, right? They're coming after our attendees. We're not gonna be able to get those out anymore. So go in, get your order, mypillow.com. You got the sheets, you got the towels, you got the mattress toppers. There are specials that are running all throughout the month of December, and I believe this week they're doing special cyber sales all this week. So go in, get your order. This next story, it's, you know, there's another case that's been going on. We haven't covered it day to day, but man, you got it. this headline, I just had to mention it. Jussie Smollett, you guys remember Jussie Smollett, Juicy Smollett. He's on trial for, as we all know, faking the hate crime that took place a couple years ago in Chicago, or I guess it was early last year. His lawyers are now claiming, this is how bad his case is going, his lawyers are claiming that the judge in the case attacked them. The judge attacked them, and they're asking for a mistrial. Listen to this. Like a scene on Empire drama inside Judge James Lynn's courtroom, Jussie Smollett's attorney called for a mistrial in part for a comment made by Lynn, accusing Judge Lynn of physically lunging at attorney Tamara Walker during a sidebar huddle amongst lawyers. Attorneys also accused the judge of making snarling faces throughout testimony. Judge Lynn denied the allegations and the request for a mistrial, saying, quote, I'm stunned that you would consider a mistrial. 
Ola Osendaro, another star witness in the case against Jussie Smollett, testified Thursday, explaining to the jury that the actor instructed him to place a rope around his neck and douse him in gasoline. He said in court, I wasn't comfortable pouring gasoline on somebody. I didn't think it was safe. Instead, he filled a hot sauce bottle with bleach. The rope was still draped around Smollett's neck when police arrived to his apartment. Ola says Smollett didn't trust him to do the punching during the staged attack. He said, quote, he didn't think I'd be able to hold back my punches. Smollett is facing felony disorderly conduct charges for lying to police about staging his own attack and paying the brothers to carry it out. Abel Osindara also testified and denied questions from Smollett's attorneys, suggesting that he was romantically involved with the actor. Friends of Smollett standing by his claims of innocence. I've known him for so long, and there is no way that Jesse Smollett would do anything like this. And of course, we all remember what Kamala Harris had to say about her good friend, Jesse. Which tweet? What tweet? Uh, the, about uh, saying that it is a modern day lynching that, um, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Jesse Smollett. Um, I, I, okay, so I will say this about that case. I think that the facts are still unfolding and um, I'm very um, concerned about obviously now look, I don't know exactly what the sentencing phase is going to be in this, but Jesse, you got caught and it's so bad that your own lawyers are trying to do everything they can to literally pull a Jesse Smollett to get out of this. The judge ain't going to buy it. And I guarantee you, the jurors are definitely not going to buy it. You messed up, man. You messed up. You didn't like that you weren't getting paid enough on your show, so you wanted to go big. You thought you could play games, and everyone in politics went along with this. It's very sad. I guess you could just say it's Maka country. Well, that's all the time we have for today. That is, finishes up our week here on Human Events Daily. I want to remind everybody, be the influence agent. Share this out with your normie friends. Remember our motto to you, be good, be brief, be gone. This is information, not indoctrination, human events daily. But before we go, it's time for today's moment of history. Edward R. Murrow, today, December 3rd, 1943, delivered his classic orchestrated hell broadcast over CBS radio, describing a nighttime bombing raid in Berlin. He commented, men die in the sky while others are roasted alive in their cellars. Berlin last night wasn't a pretty sight. In about 35 minutes, it was hit with about three times of the amount of stuff that ever came down on London in a night-long blitz. Total war is not a place that we ever want to see happen again. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, you have my permission to lay ashore. This is your brain. This is your brain on socialism. Any questions? Well, that's it for us here in Washington, D.C. The entire Human Events team, thanks you so much for watching us this week. Now it's back to Phoenix, Arizona, as Turning Point Live continues on the couch. Take it away, John. Thanks, Jack. Hi, everybody. I'm not John Root. I just play one on TV, but I'm glad to welcome you into the Bill and Rebecca Dunn Freedom Center in sunny Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, it's December 3rd, 2021, and this is TPUSA Live. A lot is happening in the world, a lot of insanity, chaos, and confusion, but we're here to make it all make sense. 
We're going to talk today about Jesse Smollett, toxic masculinity, uh, the fall of the Republic, and we're going to play a game before talking to a former Marxist about how she went from Bernie to based. Buckle up. TPOSA Live starts now. I should have timed that. Authentic, unfiltered, grassroots content and conversation every weekday. Live from Phoenix, Arizona at the Turning Point USA headquarters, this is TP USA Live. Hey, everybody. Turns out we're live. <laughs> I, like I said, I am no John Root. Um, I love it. Thanks, Aubrey. Oh, um, I love it. This is great. So we're off to a really strong start. And, uh, you know, right before I went on, they said, try not to show up John too much. So that was me doing that. <laughs> so anyway, now we're, now we're going to get very serious. Uh, does anybody remember a guy by the name of Jesse Smollett? I think Dave Chappelle called him mm. Juicy Smollett. Juicy right? Smollett. Yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what a joke. But listen. It told us a lot about our country back in 2019 when it was January 29th, I think it was, in Chicago at 2 a.m. It was the coldest day in Chicago that we've seen in generations. Mm -hmm. Negative 14. It was colder in Chicago than it was in the South Pole. <laughs> and Juicy Smollier <laughs> decides, this multimillionaire, allegedly he's an actor, musician, I don't know. Uh, he went out at 2 a.m. naturally to go get some Subway. Um, That's what you do when it's so right. Yeah, Obviously. Yeah, subway at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, subway. I didn't even know people landed <laughs> Subway anymore. Uh, but... <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, so he goes to go get some subway, and then next thing you know, boom, he's attacked by two red hat wearing, you know, kind of uh, white people apparently, mm -hmm. right? And that's what he says. And they put a noose around his neck, and he never gets a sandwich, right? So we saw this happen, and then immediately the media latched onto it, right? Do you oh, remember of this? Of course. The of media course. latched onto it, and they said that this is a racist mm -hmm. attack. It's white supremacist. But they believed him at face value they because didn't wait obviously. Didn't for any of the facts to come out. Oh, never mind the facts. Yeah. Because do. literally, a toddler could look at the facts of the case, right, and be like, "Wait a second." Wait a second. Something's a little something. Yeah. Yeah, Just a little like, bit. How, how many of these, you know, conservative red hat wearing thugs are just roaming around the streets of Chicago at 2 a.m.? I can't imagine that's a safe place for them to be, yeah. right? Not so much. Is that? Do you do that no, in New York? No, that a Democrat city as well. Right. Look at the way that they vote. Yeah, right. seriously. Yeah. I think they went for Clinton 83 to... Uh, to whatever the hell the other side of 83 is mm. back in 2016. <laughs> um, I don't do numbers. Uh, I barely do words. <laughs> so um, anyway, the trial is going on this week. It started on Monday, but you probably didn't hear about it because it's not being pushed onto all of our TVs like the Kyle Rittenhouse trial no. was. Why do you think that is? It's a narrative. It's, a it's, all about, it's all about the narrative. Right. It's always ever about the narrative. There's only a certain narrative that they're trying to put out. And if it's not white man bad, black man good, then they're not going to, you know, especially when it comes to the case of Juicy Smollier, this French actor, as Dave Chappelle always says. Right. You know, when it comes to this guy, I mean, you see the narrative that he's trying to push out and it just fell flat on its face. Right. And now it's not getting any coverage. No, 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 no. Shh. Of course not. Yeah, because it, it, go ahead. No, I was going to say, but unfortunately, like when it did initially come out, and mm -hmm. obviously we're hearing from the police because an investigation has to be conducted. Right. Mm -hmm. All of the reporters immediately started taking their side. And then mm -hmm. Kamala was, Harris, yeah. the oh day of, uh, you can read the quote. But yeah, yeah, no, the, so K Kamala Harris, oh, Vice goodness. President mm -hmm. Kamala Harris, uh, excuse me, God help us. <laughs> uh, she sends out this tweet. I don't have the exact word in front of me, but it basically says, what we saw with Jesse Smollett was a modern-day lynching, mm. right? And America is a terrible place for black people. They need to be able to feel safe, blah, 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 in Chicago, obviously, right? right. <laughs> so the kind of media, they ruminate on that for a little bit. Then the police are like, wait a sec, we're going to get involved here. They get involved. The facts start coming out. And we realize that this was probably not a hate crime perpetrated by two right. MAGA hat-wearing white people. And so a dutiful reporter, God love him, goes up to Kamala. Kamala, and they say, Vice President Kamala Harris, and they say, uh, do you want to retract any of your tweet that you sent out? And watch how she responds. Which tweet? What tweet? Uh, the, about uh, saying that it is a modern day lynching that, um, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, Jesse Smollett. Um, I, I, okay, so I will say this about that case. I think that the facts are still unfolding. What a stupid woman. She, <laughs> just so we're all clear, she is one heartbeat away, one 79-year-old heartbeat away from having the nuclear codes. So 
pray, I guess. But, um, you know, fi final thoughts, Pierre? Yeah, you... I want to point out, actually. So one of the men, Jesse Smollett, allegedly, right? And we have to mm -hmm. say allegedly because there hasn't been a verdict, right? True. Um, that Jesse Smollett paid to stage this hate crime that took place, uh, and he said this on Wednesday, said, and this is a quote from Wednesday, he explained that he wanted me to fake beat him up. Mm -hmm. He also said Smollett directed nearly every aspect of the fake attack, from the racial and homophobic slurs to use and who should throw the punches. In addition to that, he told them not to bring their phones in case they dropped them or use a ride-sharing app to prevent any record of their location. Yeah. And so, this is... Right. right. And it, all of this is coming out. But, you know, I think what this does, and I think we can all recognize racism is real, mm -hmm, homophobic sure. crimes... Um, against, you know, uh, homophobic hate crimes are real and it's evil. But what's also evil is staging a, a fake Absolutely. hate crime of racism. Well, it's not that he just did that. He tried to start a race war. Right. Um, so that's obviously a problem. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll be right back. We're going to talk a little about toxic masculinity. See you soon. Critical race theory is the most racist thing that is being spread in popular life in America. Critical race theory is bigoted. It is a lie. Racism is now being taught to our kids. Dividing kids based on race, trying to say some are oppressors and some are oppressed is absolutely unacceptable. CRT is racist. It is abusive. It discriminates against one's color. It's not critical race theory. It's racism. is now on TPUSA Live. It'll be here every day in case you want to hear me out along with the rest of the Turning Point USA team. Don't miss out on all the conservative You have to ask the question, how is the most heavily funded tribe have the poorest population? Listen to me. Uh -huh. My country is very because everything problem here. Don't have petroleum for bush and Cuban, for car, for life, yeah. for nothing. And it sucks. Sucks is it sucks. There's no other way you can describe it. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, I didn't get a chance to do this before because we were um, a little bit distracted by something else. But I am here with uh, the one and only, the great Stephen Davis, uh, also known as Maga Hulk. He's a TPOSA contributor and host of Smash on TPOSA Live. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have with us Pierre Wilson, the National Director of Blexit. Let's Is go. That right? Yes, sir. That's right. It's so great to have you both here. And I, 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 uh, great to be here. Yeah. I, I, I want to point out that in a very toxic move, we did kick the woman off of the couch. Patriarchy. Uh, the patriarchy <laughs> reigns supreme on TPUSA Live. But she'll be back, uh, probably. So anyway. Up in the air. <laughs> up in the air. We all know. It's a little up in the air, frankly, you know, in this economy. So, <laughs> so we're here to talk a little bit about toxic masculinity mm. because I think mm. that what we're witnessing today is a very, very hard time that our country's going right. through, right? And right. you've heard the quote, I'm sure, right? Weak men create hard times. So how did we get here, do you think? When did we start seeing this decline of actual masculine men, gender roles, you know, things that were objectively true and permanent and, you know, good and beautiful, right? How do, how do we get to where we have, like, these transgender people running around and kids choosing their genders at age one and, uh, you know, chemical castration happening in Arkansas? What's the deal? Well, you know, I really think that there's, there's a nefarious push when it comes to the left, when it comes to any type of manly men. We're toxic, right? They're trying to denigrate us men. And we all understand that downfall of society comes when men mm -hmm. don't fulfill our roles as men, as masculine, strong, God-fearing men, right, who believe in something. Right. And you look at the fall of society, you look at the downfall of society, you see that the, you know, men are being uh, uh, told that they're toxic. You see these Gillette commercials where they're That's having, right. you know what I'm saying? They're, seeing, they're showcasing men or, or, or that you shouldn't be a masculine man. It's all catered towards the feminine and the feminine's taking over the, the, the masculine. And it's all about femininity, you know, all this femininity and, and never mind the toxic, uh, uh, the masculinity. It's all a terrible narrative to destroy the man and to destroy the society. 
society as a whole. Totally, and let me be clear, femininity is a great thing. I love women, frankly. Um, And I'm I'm sure both of you do too, right? Uh, But like, there has to be a balance, right? Because a society can become way too feminine. Look at the French, look at the Canadians, right? Uh, but a society can also become too masculine, Truth. right? Look at uh, Soviet Russia yes. with uh, with uh, Stalin, and then uh, uh, who's the fellow down in the Philippines who's just kind of killing everybody who leaves their house, right? It, it's, it gets a little bit too much. So yeah. America has a rare opportunity to strike a balance, right? I think there's a really good quote here. It's from C.S. Lewis, and in The Abolition of Man, he wrote, we make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We mm-hmm. laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the downfall of man and the downfall yeah. of the masculine ideal of the American man was instigated by something in society. And then all of a sudden, I think a lot of conservatives in particular are sitting here with our hands up mm-hmm. and saying, well, how did we get here? Yeah. Well, it's because conservatives didn't stand up for what was right for masculinity, right? Yep. And then, you know, how should we be doing that moving forward? I think, I think the thing we have to look at is what is the, the whole feminist movement, right? What yeah. are we What are we pushing here, right? Are we put? We're, we're saying we want to be equal, but are you? What's wrong with having a man in the household who is taking care of the bills? Nothing. Why Why would you not want the option to be able to stay home and take care of your children? Right. Right. Do you, I mean you, you go to a workplace? You're gonna have a boss there. Mm. Right? People don't necessarily don't talk about there. that. So yeah. You want to be a You want to be a slave to a boss? You, you stay home with your kids. Have a man that's paying the bills for you. Be able to to be that mother right. um, that the kids need in the home. But I think it's important for us to understand that a lot of this is is happening through society, not so much a politics. It's through culture. Yes. You, yeah. the, the music industry. Yes. Um, yeah. Movies, uh, TV shows, Speak. everything you, you see on TV nowadays. They're pushing this agenda. Um, against the man, they're breaking mm-hmm. down the man. It started even in Black America. You look at yeah. how they're pushing welfare, yeah. um, and you can't have. A, I mean, they, they penalize you for having a man in the home. Absolutely. Right. Um, for the, which, it's silly to me, right? Yeah. Why would you not want to is. push the family unit? We all know kids do better when there's a two-parent household. Yep. Right. I mean, you can look at so many different things that has taken place throughout. Um, the last couple of years, and I do agree, conservatives didn't stand up quick enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I could go on to college campuses and I can talk mm-hmm. about that. I have to hold, we can do a whole segment on that. Yeah. Right. Um, I think now we're recognizing that we have to fight back, and I think it's through culture. Yes, sir. Um, not necessarily just politics. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and they, you know they say yeah. politics is downstream from culture, but right. culture is downstream from the church. Right? Yes, sir. And what yeah. we saw, it's the opening of the Bible. I mean, mm-hmm. you really don't have to dig too deep, right? <laughs> it says. In the beginning, God created man and woman, right? Yeah, and simple. it's really that simple. Yeah. And there's a reason why he did both of them. Yep. It's because you need both of those things to create a just society, yep. a, a, something that's objectively, again, permanent, true, and good, and beautiful, right? Yes. Um, you brought up a really interesting point. I, I think that you're right that conservatives haven't really done enough because we right. kind of just sat back and said, well, you know, if we just sit back and let Obergefell, the gay marriage mm-hmm. ruling in the Supreme Court, if we kind of just let them have that, yeah then that's fine, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. Nothing's going to happen from there, right? There's yeah. no such thing as a slippery slope, right? Well, and, and now we next, thing, yeah, next thing, you we know, wrong. wrong, correct, exactly. <laughs> but we said, you know, in the name of liberty and freedom mm-hmm. and, you know, the right to exercise your, you know, kind of, you know, whatever the hell that mm-hmm. is, right? Mm-hmm. To pursue licentiousness is what yeah. it is, mm-hmm. not liberty. Yeah. Um, we kind of just let that slide. And now look where we are, right? Yeah. We've got drag queen story hours. We've got... U.S. Navy ships being named after people like Harvey Milk. Did right. you see yeah. this, right? Absolutely. A, t- a pedophile, a yes. gay pedophile yeah. from San Francisco, and we're naming our warships after him. So, obviously, China is taking us very seriously. They're quivering, Clearly, they're right. quivering in their <laughs> boots, <Clearly>. right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely disgusting. It's unbelievable. But did you see that? Also, this, I think, is really interesting. So, we, one thing that's missing is we don't have an ideal man anymore, right? Mm. Who, do, who, do, who do boys have to look up to? Right. Yeah. I mean, they should have their fathers, obviously. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there was a time whenever we had cultural icons, mm-hmm. cultural figures that mattered to us. They yeah. became part of our, 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 our American ethos. Yeah. Right. I know uh, Walter Payton was a big one. Mm-hmm. And Jim Brown. Those are some big football stars. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, you had you know, you had Babe Ruth. Lou Gehrig is a yes. perfect example of it. Right. These are sports stars. You know, then you go to Hollywood. John Wayne is a great example. Mm-hmm. of masculinity. The Clint manly Eastwood, man. Right. All of these things. But who do we have today? We have. Uh, George Floyd, you know, they're building statues to him, right? And then we've got LeBron James, who just, you know, absolute clown, G's puppet. I mean, he's got he's got G's hands so far up his bum, he can hardly drive a ball. But <laughs> yeah, so that, that's the other thing that we need to talk about here is like, yeah. why don't we have anyone to look up to? And I think that there's a reason. 
It's that the media is constantly colluding with the left mm -hmm. to push. We always say That's this. It. We say it all the time. The it's going to yep. get old. The woke yep. mob. They've been to the woke mob. Yeah. Yep. And this is kind of a fun little way that they're doing it. And it's subtle. So you have to be paying yep. attention to notice it. But three different publications, they named or they put Dr. Fauci, and I hate even calling him a doctor, mm -hmm. on the sexiest man alive <laughs> for 2021, right? The dude is like five foot five. He looks like a like a like a rat from Brooklyn. And <laughs> that's being generous. He, yeah, so he's, he's eighty one years old. I don't know if you've seen his teeth. I mean, the things are like it, it's disgusting. He, yeah. He's uh, not sexy. I'm sorry. No, right? Not at all. Right? Not, a, not yeah. the least bit. Yeah. But that's who that's who we're putting up there to right. say this is the ideal man. Right. Yeah. And then, and then, and then you're surprised that we have a weak society, right? right? I mean, we have a weak president at that. Of course, I mean, so that's, absolutely. That's, that's, that's we don't that. even have a president. We don't, we don't even know who's president, <laughs> right? Because right? exactly. Joe Biden said ne himself. Right? Neither does the president, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I will. I will say though, one person who I do appreciate in, in the lack in this environment that lacks strong men is uh, Tucker Carlson. Yeah, you know, someone phenomenal. who I think is fighting back, um, who is unapologetic in his approach. Right. Yeah. Um, I think we need more Tuckers. Yes, uh, we do out there. More yes, real men that's willing to stand up. So. I totally agree with that. Yeah. I mean, Tucker, Tucker knows that things that matter are rooted in classic traditional values, mm -hmm. right? He's a true conservative. Absolutely. Um, he talks all the time about a three-tied knot. We had him on the show. This mm -hmm. is what Edmund Burke wrote about. That ties the past, the present, and the future all together. And that's Love how it. you create a strong society, right? Yeah. Love it. Um, you're a father, right? Absolutely. Three, three wonderful young three kids. Three wonderful yeah. young kids. Did, yes. you, did you decide when they were born that you were going to let them pick their gender? Or did you go with what Goodness. God assigned them? God is already, the assignment was done. Yeah. God already assigned their gender, and that was That's that. Right. And we, we don't raise them with that confusion of you get to decide and whatever yeah. you feel. We, matter of fact, when my wife just had, we, she obviously gave birth to my two month old, and um, I was so upset because in the hospital it, it referred to as a birth in person. On the paperwork, it said birth in person. You've got to um, be kidding me. And I'm like, so now she's not even a mom, so we're getting rid of the gender of the mom now to, right, to right. refer to them as a birth in person. So um, none of that in our household, right? And, I, and I, if I can encourage people to homeschool, uh, yes. that's another yes. <laughs> another path I think conservatives yes. and people in America need to take because these school systems are fighting back against what the parents are teaching mm, at home. Yeah. So even though we're teaching our kids the right thing, you send these kids to school and then they have a whole different narrative and it's confusing children. Yeah. Um, right. So, you know, yeah, I, there is none of that, you know, what gender are you in my household? Absolutely yeah. not. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a wonderful, beautiful girl yeah. and two wonderful, beautiful boys. Let's go. That's Good what I got. <laughs> that's all right. That, that's, exactly, that's exactly how we should be doing it, right? Yeah. You got to have start having these big families and like, Caring for kids. them and yeah. being an have example. More kids. For yes. them. Have more kids, damn it. Why not? Get married we need first. To. We can't let right? the left one anyway. We gotta raise some conservative exactly. babies. Exactly. <laughs> the more we bolster our ranks, the better it is right. for society anyway. Right. So exactly right. Let's have some more kids, huh? That's exactly right. Well, not you and me, but uh, <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, another one that's uh, actually to that point. You know what's really interesting? Mm. China has always had this policy, right? Of I think it was a one child or two child policy, yes. right? Mm. Now all of a sudden they're loosening it and they're saying China. Y'all can have more kids now. We're going to yep. let you do it, right? Yep. Do why, it. why are they doing that? Because they see that America is, is, is sitting here saying, stop having kids mm -hmm. because yep. that's oppressive and patriarchal and dangerous. And, yep. you know, it's too, you know, Judeo-Christian and white or whatever that, that means, right? And so they're mm -hmm. like, ooh, this is, our, this, is our, this is our time to shine, right? Absolutely. Um, so we're going to get absolutely steamrolled by China if we don't do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're banning things that we, that we promote over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They know? just ban mm -hmm. sissy men, I think is what yeah. they yes. call it, right? And then, I mean, How about I, that for an idea? I think that's I think okay. It's great. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, think we it's need okay. a strong society. Yeah. We need a strong society of manly men who are going to stand up for, on the courage of their convictions yeah. and say, hey, no more. Yeah. Okay, we're going to stand up. We're going to be strong. We're going to be men. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to do. And China's saying, okay, we see America. We see Americans. We see the fact that this, uh, uh, this sissified culture is taking prominence, yeah. Yeah. right? Harry Styles wearing dresses. <laughs> Yep. Constantly putting men in dresses. I mean, yep. you see this. Stop it. It's yep. stop. Just stop. <laughs> just stop. It's never good. We, just... we, have enough, we have enough to choose from, right? We really do. <laughs> We're good. Stop. We don't it's, need it's, 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 a, it's annoying. It's really annoying because it shows it's the weird agenda. Too, it's right? weird. We don't have to paint our fingernails every five yeah, no. minutes. I and promise you, we things. don't. But people we still choose to. to. I'm like, what are you yeah. doing? That's, yeah. that's a lot of effort. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing is that we've kind of just put up with it. But I feel I feel like we're getting to a point, I'd love to see it, where a lot of people are just standing up and saying, you know what? Like, no, no. this is yeah. this is weird. This, this is, is creepy. Is I don't weird. want to do it anymore, right? right? Because you're, you're just... 
and you have you're you, hairy and you're impressed. and you have to be you have to you have to be bold though because yeah. people yeah. are going to attack you. you yeah, have to, you have to expect that because society is pushing that to make that normal. Yeah. right. But we no. need that's why we need strong men that's yeah. exactly right. to stand up and say no, it's not. Mm-hmm. It's not normal. It's not normal. Because if not. we continue to stay quiet, I know that we're doing it in our household, right. but if we don't speak up, right. then you're going to see majority of the country become that way or, or grow up in a world. Kids are going to grow up in a world where that's normal. Right. Yes. A country where that's normal. Yes. And it's not normal. Of course yes. it's not normal. <laughs> Charlie and I always say on the show, we say, you should strive to be the same person in public that you are in private, right? Boom. So if you think it's creepy and weird whenever you're in your home just talking to your family it. around the dinner yeah. table, yes, sir. then say that, yeah. right? Be bold and say yeah. that, yes. right? Yeah. Um, and on, a, on kind of a yeah. more serious yeah. note, I guess, and I think this is actually something that's incredibly infuriating, and to me it was the biggest sign of the death of the American man. So in Philadelphia, I don't know if you saw this story, uh, about two months ago maybe, right? there was a woman who got on a train, an illegal alien got on a train behind her, uh, and he raped that woman yes. for 40 yeah. minutes, for yep. t- like 12 stops straight. And no one did anything. And no one did a damn thing. Yep. I can guarantee you, if you were on that, oh, you on that bus, <laughs> He, he wouldn't exist anymore. Same no. with you. Same he, with me, frankly, right? You'd be a pretzel right now. But yep. I'm thinking like, that... <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yes, indeed. Oh, I can visualize. That. Yes, just, indeed. Pulling arms and legs all over the place. Yeah, I mean, like, but but nothing to me is more indicative of the fall of man, yeah. Than yeah. That, right? Because if you can't even stand up for right. for for an innocent, you know, if we yeah, want to take it back sick. to the basics, that's that's that's, you know. that's 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 that shows where our society has come, yeah. how far we have fallen. I mean, that is a sad situation. Yeah. I mean, first of all, to the to the person to that. The victim in that situation right. that's horrible yeah. and i'm sad you didn't have any strong men around you right and this was new york correct right so out of all play i mean philadelphia, yeah. philadelphia. i mean same city yeah. that's supposed to be a grit and tough city right well, yeah I mean, right it's also supposed to be a city of brotherly love yeah <laughs> but it was no, no love right no Apparently, love for no lo- but here's the thing though I, I i honestly i have a lot of conversations with me right and i have a lot of conversations especially about this situation yeah. and I, I i remember i have a co-worker out that i'm working with and I was explaining to him the situation. He was saying, you know what? It's none of our business, though. It's not, honestly, it's none of our business. You know, whatever oh, happens, you don't is. know if they can get shot or things of this nature. I'm and just like, are raped. you kidding me? And she's being raped. And she's being raped? We, we're supposed it's to be our, our brother's business? keeper, right? That's the entire idea here. Of course it's our business. I think that that's what the pandemic did to us, though, right? Yeah. Yes. Is that all of a sudden we're not allowed to be like, oh, I don't want to get too close to you. I don't want to violate social right. distancing Right. Let me make my mask, like my mask on. Yeah, yeah, make sure yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, but let me be clear. If the Rangers wasn't wearing raped. a mask, then, I mean, they would have been all over yeah. it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fauci, you got to get off of it. <laughs> right. Put your mask on yeah. before you go back in, right? It's disgusting, it's and we've got to do something yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, so, mm. on a lighter mm. note, we're going to play a game next. Christiane is going to join us back on the couch, and... I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Let's go. Have you ever played before? I have not, but we're going to do it. We're going to do we're it. Gonna we're going to do, do, <laughs> do it. Really, we're going to do it really well. My it's pass. going to be a great game. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to TPSA Live. I'm Connor Clegg, the producer of The Charlie Kirk Show. This is 
Christiani Allen, is that Hello. right? Christiani, yes. tell us a little bit about yourself. I, I, I neglected oh, to do any introductions at the beginning because I, I lost my little things. It was a whole ordeal. <laughs> so do, tell, tell the people. All right. Um, my name is Christiani Allen. I used to handle Mayor Rudy Giuliani's comms for two years. I'm now at Getter. Getter, love Getter. Uh, fastest growing social media platform in history. Ooh. Speaking of big tech, um, huh. Twitter's new CEO last year, as you probably are already aware, oh, yeah. said that Twitter is not bound by the First Amendment. That's not even a paraphrase. Yeah. That's a direct quote. Yeah. So I think this is a warning signal for any individual domestically and abroad to uh, that um, political censorship and censorship just in general mm -hmm. is coming to Twitter and that everyone needs to get their intellectual property off of Twitter and over on Getter. So hit me up, Christiani Allen, happy to take care of that for you. Um, but yeah, that's a quick rundown. Fantastic. G-E-T-T-R, Getter. Yeah. Hey, welcome back to the couch. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back to the couch. It's great to have you here. The patriarchy has been uh, demolished. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Thanks a lot. So we're going to play a game. Um, it's called, I'm told, Two Truths and a Lie. All right? Oh, boy. And so how this works is I'm going to tell you three things. Okay. Uh, two of them are going to be true. One of them is not going to be true. And you're going to have to guess which one is the lie. Um, all of this, of course, hinges on my ability to know how to read. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and our ability to answer. Right. Right. People we'll see how that right. goes. Can we phone a friend? Can yes. we phone? Lifeline. I, I am open to bribes, so I, I, I can be bought. So let's get this thing started. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Sorry. Exactly right. United States today. Ten percent for the big guy. Right. Right. That's, That's right. That's right. right. All right. Let's get this started, and someone's going to keep score, and we're going to have a lot of fun. All right. Oh boy. So here's the first one. Two truths, one lie. Okay. President Ronald Reagan was the 40th president of the United States. It's one of them. President George Washington was the only president that was unanimously elected. Uh, and then President George Washington served three terms as president. Which one of those is the lie? What do you think? I need the second one read to me again. Yeah. I can do that again. <laughs> president George Washington was the only president unanimously elected. What do you think the answer is? Pass the buck? <laughs> Circle back mm. to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be Jen Psaki. <laughs> this is going to be a whole lot of circling. <laughs> so what about that phone in front again? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, is that a thing? Do you get the answer? Do, no, I, I, I have the answers. That would be <laughs> cheating. We don't do that. Ladies first. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. we're gentlemen here. <laughs> I love it. I wish I could we're read real men. So, yeah, Okay, so men, let, yeah. let's boil this down here. Ronald Reagan was the 40th president of the United States. So Kennedy was 35. He was the 35th president, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, sure. what does that make Ronald Reagan? I love that everyone's looking know. at me. No. Uh, expert. Anyone? Okay. I'm going to say... Why don't we go to the I'm next one? Say, Let's go, go to the next one. Let's go to the yeah, next yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, that was a whole lot of ways because there was, there was W. Right. Or there his was father. both W's. It was his father. It was Clinton. Yeah. W. Right? Obama. So, that, Trump, was, Trump, that one's true, that, that right? That was true. Yeah. So so I'm going to go with that last one. Okay. Last What was the last one again? President Washington served three terms as president. Is that true or false? False. Yes. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just needed to read it. All right, we get the game now. <laughs> that was team. We, we, we work as team. We the team. Oh my gosh, that is horrible. We can't answer we, that. Let's go. <laughs> I, I We're doing what we got. I really didn't want to skip it because I was like, this doesn't work. Oh, wow. <laughs> I really just didn't hear it. Oh, that's okay. okay. That's okay. All right. We're, We're going to try We're again. We're warmed up now. Let's go. We're going to try again. Yes. That one looks long. For um, Pete's sake. All right. How about this one? The inventors of Pringles. Are you familiar with Pringles? Yeah, they're chips. Mm -hmm. the chips. The potato chips. Mm -hmm. His ashes are buried in a Pringles can. Mm -hmm. Right? That's one. Mm -hmm. Artificial Christmas trees originated in France. Maybe. Okay. Uh, or it could be true or it could be false. A cloud could weigh more than a million pounds. Which one's the lie? A cloud could weigh more than a million pounds. Is that your final answer? I think I'm so. A, I'm going okay. to go with that as well. How do you weigh how a do, cloud? How do you weigh <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Good question. Uh, you going with that? I'm going to go with it. You're all wrong. Oh, Dang, turns out. <laughs> no, um, so <clears throat> turns out artificial Christmas trees actually originated in Germany because obviously Germany has a lack of trees. So, <laughs> on the next one. so what do we got? Fantastic. Oh my gosh. Fantastic. I, actually, in I, Germany, I, I, I found an interesting thing on the, on the, uh, the inventor of Pringles. I think that he actually meant to start a tennis ball company, but instead of rubber, 
they sent him a bunch of potatoes, <laughs> right? Because they have those kind of tennis ball kind of cans. He was yeah. like, screw it. We'll cut them up and fry them, oh, right? Why not? So who has the Pringles cans canned with his ashes? Who? What family member has? No. And the and you gotta keep it away from the mix. pantry, though. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> little midnight snack yeah. from the other well, family. Oh goodness gracious! <laughs> oh, yeah. good God. Uh, beautiful. Please don't eat the right Please right don't eat it. Well, <laughs> they're not crumpled up Pringles. That's just, yeah, that's, that's just ashes. As far yeah, as you that's know, him. Oh, depends on how many Pringles he ate in his lifetime. All right, here's one more. Probably two more. All right, here's the first one. James Madison and George Washington were the only presidents to sign the Constitution, or the only people who signed the Constitution who went on to be presidents, rather, right? Okay. Um, president Jimmy Carter was the youngest president. And tell me whether or not this is true or false. When President Reagan was shot by an assassin in 1981, he survived, but he joked, well, I forgot to duck. Number two. That sounds like first Reagan, one's false. so I would say. First one's false? Oh. Well, can first you read false? the first one again? I think so. Yeah, yeah. So, James Madison and George Washington are the only two men who went on to become presidents to sign the Constitution. Oh. What, I think the, yeah. the gist of the question, is there another man who was at the Constitutional Convention who signed it that went on to become president? So, okay. Or was President Jimmy Carter the youngest president? I have a hard time believing that Jimmy Jim Carter was the youngest president, yeah. right? Like that? I, I have a hard right. time believing that one. Okay. Um, Final answer? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stick with number two. First answer. Huh? Let's go. Okay. I'm probably embarrassing my family. I'm gonna <laughs> stick with my answer. <laughs> You're going with number one. You're a disgrace. I'm gonna go with number two. Okay. You're wrong. Dang. Um, so Jimmy Carter was not the youngest president. Yeah. He was the <laughs> most. Uh, he was the most inept and incompetent. Oh, so they were wrong too. President. Oh, we were wrong too. No, 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 no. Yeah. They were right. We were right. He wasn't yeah. the youngest president. He was. Yeah. All right. Well, although, wait, wait, wait. although, wait a second. Wait, I don't wait. know if you understand. Wait. wait. <laughs> Can we phone a friend? Yeah, still? Five. Can the host phone a friend? Five. All right. I can tell you what is true is that Washington and Madison were the only ones to sign the Constitution who went on to become presidents. That is true. Uh, and Jimmy Carter was not the youngest president. He was not the youngest president. He was president. not the youngest yeah. president. Okay. You're right. You're right. The, yeah. youngest, yeah. the youngest man Good to job. ever be elected president <laughs> was, was JFK. That's what I was, yeah, yeah. But the youngest man to ever serve as president, did you, do you know who that is? No. It wasn't JFK. I can't tell you. Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, because Teddy Roosevelt came that. to office as a vice president after uh, his predecessor was shot, and that was uh, William McKinley. So hmm. he was young. I think oh. he might have been like 33, 34. It was on the we are getting a history lesson. Yeah. Lord have mercy. So, so, you USA. Yeah, right, get your history. Get, you, get, get your, your history. history. Yes, indeed. And come to Amfest. <laughs> and come to Amfest <laughs> to, heads up to get this. more history. Right. You, you can watch us play this game live at Amfest. <laughs> yes, indeed. And Why fail not? miserably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll do one more. We'll do one more. Oh, All right. President, uh, so remember, two truths and a lie. Two okay. of these things are true. Two one true, of them is a lie. I'm mainly saying that to remind myself. Me um, too. <laughs> President John Adams died on the same day as Thomas Jefferson. I need you to say it again. Sorry. <laughs> She's always like, wait. President, <laughs> <It's> right. <laughs> President John Adams died on the same day as Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Uh, that's mm -hmm. one. Number two, President Barack Obama won a Grammy Award in 2006. And number three, President's Day is the second Monday in February. So two truths and a lie. So <laughs> one is false. So which one's the lie? I feel like Obama does have a Grammy. Yes. Uh -huh. But I don't know if he, did he win it in 2006? Can you read the first one again? <laughs> yeah, John Adams died on the same day as Thomas Jefferson. We're going to have to make a speed round. I think so we're that's gonna... true. Uh-huh, okay. I th so it's the last one. Yeah, I'm going to go with three. So number three is the lie? I'm going to go with three, yeah. yeah. Three is the lie? Please tell us we're right on one. Three, three, three number three again? President's Day is the second Monday in February. So true or false? Let's go with that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, why the hell not? <laughs> all right, you're all right. We're <laughs> really good yeah. on a very high note. <laughs> so President's yeah. Day is actually the third Monday in February. How about that? Fun mm -hmm. And Barack Obama did, in fact, yes, win, win a Grammy. Grammy. I think he's okay. been nominated three times for a Grammy. Uh, but in course. 2006. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. For doing nothing. He does yeah. have a smooth voice, I will say. He, he does have he does well, for what it's worth. Voice. Oddly enough, when I was in school, I, was, I majored in communications, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Um, and <laughs> I found myself emulating Obama's kind of tone and cadence. It, was, it really is good. Yeah, it is. But that's how he's so sneaky. Yes, that's how, indeed. That's how they get he you. He has a smooth voice, but so he does can, a pimp. He can so. sell you a so, pile of mm -hmm. crap. Hey, man, I want a quote graphic on that. We're going to the media team on that. Hey, we're going to be right back to talk about a very troubling poll out of Harvard. See you soon.
This is your brain. This is your brain on socialism. Any questions? TPUSA Live. It'll be here every day in case you want to hear me out along with the rest of the Turning Point USA team. Don't miss out on all the conservative. Hey everybody, welcome back to TPUSA Live. I'm here with Pierre Wilson from Blexit, MAGA Hulk, or Stephen Davis, host of Smash on TPUSA Live, uh, powered by Turning Point USA, and yes, Christiani Allen from Getter. That's right. Hardly know her. That's right. Thanks. Um, I, no, I know you, okay, but get her, I hardly know her. It's a joke. So, anyway, <laughs> what's we not a joke, the... though, what's not a joke is Even that the <laughs> there is a very troubling poll that just came out of the Kennedy School at Harvard, right? Mm -mm. So this is a national poll of 18 to 29-year-olds that was released on Monday, and no one wants to talk about it, right? And it indicates that a majority of young Americans believe that America is basically a terrible place, right? Of course. So of course. only 7%. I'm just going to run you through some of the numbers real quick, then we're just going to sit here and rip on these young people because that's what we do. Sounds yeah. good to me. That's always fun, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, so only 7% of young Americans view America as a healthy democracy. 27% describe the nation as somewhat functioning, which is probably pretty accurate. 39 call us a democracy in trouble, and only 13%, thank God, think we are a failed democracy that's still a little high, don't yeah, you think? Yeah. Well, frankly, Charlie says this all the time, so it's ingrained in my head. We're actually not a democracy, we're a republic. Yes. As, yes. as they say. Right? Democratic democracy is actually very dangerous. Right? It is yeah. very dangerous. Isn't it? Very, very much so. Because all these sissy men that we have running around, they mm -hmm. could outrank us. Lord and all of a sudden, just because if there's more of them, which I don't think that there are. Right. There's the not. next They're thing you know, we're sent off to the island or something. <laughs> right? yeah. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> so, here's another one. 50% of 18 to 29-year-olds say that COVID-19 changed them. Is that surprising to anyone? No. I, I completely concur with no, that. of course. And then 14% say they became a very different person. 37% say they are a somewhat different person. I don't know how you measure that. Yeah. Yeah. But here's, here's the one that, that, that I thought was really depressing. 51% say that COVID-19 had a negative impact on their life. Mm -hmm. So there's something to be said about the... We talked earlier about kind of how the fall of man yeah. kind mm -hmm. of belies the fall of the republic. Yeah. You know what else belies the fall of the republic? is when your leaders know that you're suffering and they choose to do nothing about mm -hmm. it, right? Yeah. So mm. you, we all sat here and we saw kids suffer. We saw suicide rates go up. We yeah. saw mm -hmm. depression go up. We saw yeah. drug overdoses go up. Mm -hmm. All of these things. People were sad. They were lonely. They were isolated. Right. Because obviously you close the churches, you close the schools, you lock people inside their homes. Right. Um, and our leaders, like, keep doubling down. And none of the companies that we support with our uh, with our money are doing anything about it as Thank well. You. Mm -hmm. you know, the big thing actually in that in that poll uh, that stood out to me was in terms of health, and that was the 51% of young adults that reported feeling down, depressed, and hopeless. Mm. A quarter of young Americans reported thoughts of self-harm several times in the last two weeks. And my mind immediately goes to um, technology. Yes. Mm -hmm. We live in a society where all of these young people, they are glued to their phones. Mm -hmm. And it makes me then think of big tech, mm -hmm. right? And so I think of Facebook, for example. Facebook is talking about launching, and I think they're already working on it, but this metaverse, this oh, virtual crazy. reality yeah. where you can buy fake virtual clothes that you will never wear. Yep. You can go to a barber store, spend real U.S. dollars right. in this virtual reality to get your hair done in this virtual world, mm -hmm. right? It's going to become as addictive as all of these other social media platforms are. People will and never leave the house. No. They'll never leave right. the house. Right, right. And what are they doing to, to crack down on this? What are they, what are they doing? And, I mean, we already know Big Tech's not looking out for anybody. Uh, look at the political discrimination, the censorship that you see on their platforms. 
It's um, was, very unfortunate. That's what getters for, right? That's right. There that, you no, go. that's absolutely right. Not to mention it'll 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 divide the country more because mm -hmm. Facebook will be or Metaverse or whatever they want to call themselves, they'll be able to to cater everything in this metaverse world to absolutely. to their agenda, whatever narrative mm -hmm. they want to push, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think it's I think technology is I mean, yes, it's been a, a gift in some ways, but it's also Curse, the yeah. downfall yeah. of why we're also struggling to build men. They won't leave their home. Yeah. They won't right. leave video games. They won't leave all the things that are behind these screens, right? Yeah. They, it's, Absolutely. We're, we're not we're not teaching our men to get out there and work on a car. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my go, gosh. Go yeah. change Getting the tire. Oh, yeah. The yeah. masculinity some oil. subject, yeah. 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 You, know, you know how many men I know that don't know how to change a freaking tire? Right. Yeah. Like, who the hell raised you, man? They get pulled, they, they, they pull over. They call AAA because yeah. they don't know how to change their own daggone tire. They got the tire iron, the tire iron. They got the tire. They got everything they need. They got the jack. They don't know how none of it works. Yeah. You know what I'm and I'm just like, it, all you're the pieces. A man. Yeah. You can't put it together. Yeah. You can't put the. the, the I mean, it's, it's like Legos. We played yeah. Legos when we were younger, and they don't know how to put anything together. They yeah. don't know how to do anything. Right. And yeah. you're you're calling yourself a man. You're a man's man. You beat your chest and all this type of stuff, but you don't know how to do the basic yeah. things. No yeah. wonder you hate America. You're sitting in the house all day, depressed. Of I yeah. mean, what, you, what is your life like? You know, our elected yeah. officials, and because, you know, but by this poll uh, from Harvard, the Harvard poll, our elected officials would do a great deal of good by listening to what young people's concerns are right. of censorship, big tech censorship, yeah. of our elections, of immigration, yes. of political totally. divisiveness. Yes. Mm -hmm. They should, they should listen to them. We elect these officials to represent our opinions, they not the other way around. Yeah, they work for us. They work for us. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. But, and that, that raises the question, though, is like, they have to know, right? Like, they have to know mm -hmm. that people are suffering. They have to know mm -hmm. that people are unhappy. Mm -hmm. But they're not doing anything to change the course. Like, what's the end game here? Are they well, just saying to, like, you know, wait us out or, or what? Well, you, I mean, if they're not feeling the effects themselves, it's kind of like, what is it, the Hunger Games? You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's Good like they're, they're up in their ivory towers. You had people like Pelosi during mm -hmm. the pandemic, when, during the uh, beginning of the pandemic, you know, laughing in front of her $20,000, you know, uh, Fridge, fridge, yeah, fridge, yeah. Fridge, yo. With all yeah. the Jenny's ice cream. Yes, yeah. with the yeah. expensive good, ice cream. Good. Good. Speaking of which, I think she just bought a $25 million in home Florida. Yes, in she Florida. Did. Yes. Florida. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It also, I mean, Don Lemon went after sitting on CNN trashing Florida. He's down there vacationing with no mask on, living it up mm -hmm. in Florida. I mean, these people are his hypocrites. Yeah. Nancy oh, Pelosi well, during the pandemic had had the money to be able to have a private hairdresser go to the shop. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't know if you all remember I that. Remember she went that. to the oh, shop yeah. when, she when said everything she was, was on lockdown. Up. She, she said she was set up by the she hairdresser. She said she was set up by the hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> the, mayor, the mayor of Chicago, they asked her Lord about Lightful. her hair. Yeah, yeah they were mm -hmm. like, oh, your hair seems to be getting cut mm -hmm. regularly. And yeah. she's like, well, I'm an I'm elected official. I can <laughs> rule right. thee, but not for yeah. me. Yeah. I mean, right. Governor Newsom, <laughs> you better shut down all your wineries, but mine's going to stay open. Yeah, right. He was at French Laundry. And the French Laundry, absolutely. Rules for thee, but not for me. And that's what it is when it comes to these bureaucrats um, and, and these elected officials that think that they can live above what it is that they say. Or they can tell us to do one thing, yep. but they can do whatever they want to do. Yeah. And I think that's really, we the people need to stand up and say, hey, that's not okay. Exactly. Yeah. And we need to vote them out. Yep. You know, you just said, uh, it makes, in my world, right, I, I hear that and I say, censorship for thee, but not for me. Right. right? Yes. right. And again, that is yes. exactly why Big Tech, uh, that's exactly why Getter exists. Yeah. Um, we're actually thanking Jack Dorsey for the way that he clamped down on people's mm. First Amendment rights, because that's why we're here. Yeah. That's why we're here. They might yeah. not be bound by the First Amendment, but we are. And like I said, this is a siren right. call for all the individuals domestically and abroad. Mm -hmm. Get your intellectual property off of Twitter. Every tweet you've ever sent, all of your branding, all of that can be brought over by Getter's team. Mm -hmm. That is your intellectual property. Get over it. Get on Getter. G E T T R. Ooh. And you, you, you actually mentioned a really good point when you asked, or you asked a question about what was the end game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to me, if you want to, if yeah. you want to remake a country, yeah. you got to first turn people against that 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 system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the left is really doing today. They want people to hate this country. They want people to want to job. burn the country down, yeah. right? What is Black job. Lives Matter always saying? Burn the country down. Like, yeah, they want people to feel that way yeah. um, so that they can get more power. It's all about power. It's all about control. It's all, they're, they're, they're and I, you know, I don't want to get too deep it's into this. No, you're yeah. right. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. but uh, <laughs> the thing is, is that I think that we're not naturally wired, right, yeah. to hate the place that we live in. It's yeah. kind of a human yeah. instinct to feel a sense of belonging yes. in what is your right. home. That's right. what America yeah. is, right? So for an order, in order for us to hate America, mm -hmm. the left in the media, cartels, they have to make it hateable, yes. right? And so that's where we see the 1619 project yes. coming in. That's where we see things like, you know, uh, Ibram X. Kendi and all mm. these folks. And then 
God love them, but the the, 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 the folks who push the, the Native American narrative, mm -hmm. right? That we're all colonizers, mm -hmm. right? right? Mm -hmm. I mean, racist CRT. They blew, they, they blew CRT. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, that's the thing. It's yeah. all about making America out to be this vile, disgusting, mm -hmm. yes. nasty place. But I always want to ask people, if not America, then where? Where, where the that's hell else exactly do you want to go, man? Exactly where are you going? Right. You want to go to <laughs> Afghanistan where uh, yeah. women can't drive and they can't go to school and get educated? Right. You yeah. want to go to China where, you know... They only recognize up, five religions? Right, yeah. exactly. Yep. Yep. I mean, do you want to go to uh, Canada where you don't have the freedom of speech and if you say the, uh, the wrong gender mm -hmm. or, or, or misgender someone on purpose... You will get fine. How or about Australia? Germany? Germany, yeah, where they have the um, what the gates now separating yeah. the. Oh, I mean, we might go that way, but oh, like, remember that one time that one place had a wall. <laughs> the body, you know, yeah. East I West. think I've seen this film before. <laughs> right, yeah. but this story that, looks familiar. One yeah, thing, that one quote that says, "Those who don't know the history are doomed to repeat it." Yeah. You see it repeating. Yeah. Over and over yeah. and over and over again. And here we go. We're seeing it play out again. And mm -hmm. we try to speak out against it, but we're the conspiracy theorists. Right. We're the tin, fat, uh, tin hat uh, uh, wearing uh, type of individual. We don't know what we're talking about. And then it happens. We're always conspiracy theorists until we're right. Until we pick until, 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 right. Right. Yeah. until right. time catches up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> So the, Unbelievable. The, just to be kind of specific about what exactly we're talking about here, in this poll, and I thought this was the most troubling part, right? Mm -hmm. um, American exceptionalism, the idea that America is a great country that right. we're worth mm -hmm. being proud of and that it's the greatest country on earth, right? Mm -hmm. Our generation sees it as a highly divisive issue, and less than one-third, 31%, believe that America is the greatest country in the world. Less than one-third? Less Where? than one-third. Where? 31%. Where else? Nearly a fifth, Where else? Nearly a fifth, 18%, say, uh, they don't know. So they just don't even have an opinion, which, to me, is even more trouble. Right. right. Well. Either love it or hate it. Or get the hell out. How about right. that? Right. Well, that's weak. That's probably a bunch of weak men also in that poll. So yeah, exactly. Right. There's because that. And, you know, here's the thing: is like that 18 percent. They don't want that. Maybe they love America, right? Yeah. But they're so scared of saying mm. that America is a good place and yes. it's a just place and it's yeah. a right place because they don't want to be called racist, uh -huh. right? Yeah. By this apparatchik cultural arsonist mm -hmm. mob, yeah. that they have to tuck away their national pride, mm. which is so sad. Yeah. 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 And, and, and oh, wait horrible. until it becomes culturally acceptable yeah. to be proud of your country again. Yeah. You know, I, I remember growing up, and I maybe it was just my upbringing, I don't know, but I'm from Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were always obviously taught to be very proud of Texas, but with that comes a pride in nation. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I loved our presidents, I loved our family, I loved mm -hmm. our history. No matter who the president it, was, right? you respected the office right. of the you. presidency. Yeah. 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 I don't know. No, it used to be. It on. used to be that well, okay. way. I, 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 hear you. I mean, I hear you. frankly, I think yeah. when we're at but war, at the end of the day, the we're all we on the same ship. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Probably. You want them to but, yeah. Absolutely. One hundred percent. But you know what? I blame the media for so much of oh, this. Oh, the media for so totally. much 100%. of this. For peddling misinformation. Yeah. For stoking political divisiveness and all of mm -hmm. their reporting. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's sad. Yeah, the it, media it is evil. Oh, and, and, and you talk about an and you talk yeah. about yeah. course correcting. What have they done to course correct? No, it's only nothing. become worse the way that they sensationalize media. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just recently with uh, the uh, Bal Bal the Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin. Yeah, Alec Baldwin. The way yeah. that they released that clip that he mm -hmm. said, I didn't pull the trigger. Obviously, there's a ton of context to mm -hmm. that now. But, and, and Borat, the way that they sensationalized Borat before yeah. that came yeah. out. I, yeah. it, it's unfortunate. And they all With do it Rudy, for right? a buck. They yeah. all do mm -hmm. it for a buck. Even yep. what happened in uh, Kenosha, they keep labeling this as a car accident or something. I'm like, this guy. Oh, yeah. Those self-driving SUVs, self -driving. I'm telling you, those those yeah. automatons, you know, those things that they just go on their own and, yeah. you know, uh, uh, run over people and things of that nature. No driver. Yeah. Not yeah. if he's black. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, black. yeah, but if Kyle Rittenhouse were behind the wheel, oh, yeah. I can White guarantee you that the SUV would never get mentioned ever again. Yeah. It was Neo -Nazi white supremacist, yeah, yeah, yeah. toxic yeah, yeah. masculinity enthusiast, yep. <laughs> drives his SUV through Purposely. crowd of children, murders mm -hmm. grannies, <laughs> yeah, clearly. grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Trump supporter. They Trump, Trump supporter, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I saw, I think right. I saw I think a I saw maga sticker in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. no, 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 because it's Daryl Brooks, who's a, a black supremacist, right, actually, yeah, which right. arguably is as dangerous, if not 100%, more dangerous, yeah. as you yeah. can see. Right. And that gets into another subject of how we cherry pick what media, yeah. we, what news Boom. we want to show Boom. and what news we do not want to show. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think back to the Jesse Smollett case and how reporters took sides and Kamala Harris came out 
um, in support of him and stating as everything that he's saying as fact she even while spoke the to his investigation yeah. is just getting started. Yeah. He's a good man. Good man. Good man. Great man. That's right. No, and a dear yeah. friend. And yeah. Of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't think she has a genuine friend in the world. I don't. Not How could you be friends with her when she laughs like that, you right? Can't, yeah. You can't have a friend with the Joker. Yeah, here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. At the end of the day, America is a great nation yes. because we are a nation of good people yeah. at our course, yes, right? Sir. And if we can get back to where we were before, and if we can get back to learning and loving our history yes. mm -hmm. and embracing what makes us great, that we are independent, that we are charitable, that we are objectively a beautiful nation. And Go knowing on. what president signed the Constitution That's and exactly then became right. president. We'll, we'll work on that. We'll get there. We're going to get, we'll get there. there. We're going to send you back to school. They're teaching you too much Nicole Hannah-Jones. I, 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 I have to, I have to just add in one thing about that, though, the fact that they could even say that in a survey. Uh -huh. Some countries you can't even give that yeah. opinion. Yeah. Right. So again, yeah. you speak to Yeah, this the point. fact this that you're even being country. asked for your opinion right. <laughs> and not True. just made to be some sort of like weird servant yeah. Yeah. to the regime, yeah. yep. which fearly, fearfully is what we're getting closer and closer to, yeah. right? Yeah. So I mean, this is going to become rarer Absolutely. and rarer oh, yeah. and rarer. Yeah. Yep. And it's just going to start to become Pravda Media where it's like... Unless we all start taking it seriously and start speaking truth and, and shining a light on this, you know, all of the Bingo. social media accounts that we have, uh, I think about, like, you look at China, right? And we're giving examples of, okay, well, if not America, if, if America's who, not the greatest right? country on earth, who is? Mm -hmm. Look at look at the religious persecution in other parts of the mm -hmm. world, and the countries in Africa, and, and, and in China. Um, and, don't and even the, have running water. The, exactly. the Chinese right. Communist Party announced in 2019 that they had plans to rewrite the Bible to conform to Marxist doctrine. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's evil. Hey, it's yeah. been great having you all here. We're going to be right Pleasure. back with one last thing with Alex Spencer, a former Marxist. Ooh. Mm -hmm. In these United States of America, this great country of ours, we American Indians, we can be anything we want to be, except American Indians. A lot of the soldiers were very um, aggressive, so the women did get raped. What we call Huerte. Huerte means a, a place of suffering, dying, starvation, nothing. Nothing good. Just like the Nazi concentration camps. I didn't realize how corrupt things were. I didn't realize what kind of environment we were living in. We had no running water, we had no um, power. They de incentivize people from, you know, opportunity. That's why our suicide rate has climbed up astronomical rates. I moved from the poorest county in America, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, to the richest area in the country, the Navajo Indian Reservation. There is no difference. The poorest and richest reservations in our nation suffer from identical problems. This is not anything new. This is an everyday occurrence in all tribal governments. My life and my tale and my truth has been to fight socialism and I'm hoping that I can wake up as many Navajos as I can to tell them that you can do this, yeah, even if I have to fight you to save you. And I think that's what I'm also projecting to my people. Even though they are so harsh on social media and they completely hammer at me, I tell them, I'll be here even if I have to fight you to save you. Welcome back to TPSA Live for one last thing. I'm here joined by Alex Spencer, who was a former 
Marxist, communist, Soviet, Bolshevik, how do you want me to describe you? Yeah, but by the way, in the spirit of that, uh, we're going to celebrate scarcity and we only have one mug. Great. Just like uh, an old socialist would have loved. Just like back in the old days, yes. right? <laughs> so tell us about it. How did you go from Bernie to based? Yes. So <laughs> it's actually very funny because when you introduce me as a former Marxist, uh -huh. When I was a socialist, I had no idea who Marx was. I had no idea who any of these socialist communist leaders were. I had no idea what that socialism. You? That was yeah. Oh, where'd you go? We lost her. That's me. There you are. There is. There I am. I was so happy. I was like, oh, look at me. I'm a socialist. That's so cute and trendy. At um, least you weren't ugly. Most of them are ugly. <laughs> thank, thank you. Yeah. So you did um, okay there. Yes. Thank you very much. Of course. Um, but yeah, I had no idea what socialism either even was. But I was very passionate about saying that I was one, which yeah. is kind of where. Things broke down as soon as people started asking me those questions. Okay, right. what is socialism? You say you're a socialist. What is it? Well, I'm not a socialist. I'm a democratic socialist. Oh, okay, well, well what's me. the difference? And then I literally had no answer to that question. Right. Um, and I just never was exposed to any different viewpoint or anything like that. And so I was so passionate about that's what happens when you replace information with emotion. That's exactly Passion right. is not a firm foundation. It's easily broken down. So people are very surprised when they see, oh, you went from being like that crazy of a socialist, like radical feminist, and then you totally did a 180. And it's like, no, those are the least firm foundations yeah. you can have because you know nothing. And then you're just based off of that. And then it's very surprising when you start to realize how much you don't know. And I started watching different content creators, conservative commentators. Um, who Charlie just Kirk show, frankly. Charlie Kirk, a lot of turning point content that really got the wheels turning uh, and just me realizing how much I did not know. And I originally sought out those different opinions because I wanted to be able to better defend my opinions. Okay, let me look at what the opposition so, is yeah, saying. You're trying to do some opposition research. Yes. And, and then like, I was like, get a leg up oh, on them. I'm wrong. Like, Wait a second, yes. they might be <laughs> onto something. You yeah. know, I think it's always interesting. The people who uh, know the least and who are typically the dumbest mm -hmm. and, and most unimpressive, right. they usually scream the loudest, right? Right. Um, so I'm that's all they have. for the rest of the show. Yes, but um, yeah, it, loud, it's, it's, it's a song full of sound and fury that says <laughs> nothing, right? You also had a very interesting uh, tweet the other day that I thought that I, I, I really want to get your perspective on because I think it's such an important message for the movement, mm -hmm. right? So as a former leftist, mm -hmm. right, you were someone who supported, you know, the quote unquote right to choose, right? right? But you said in your tweet that pro-life activism mm -hmm. is incredibly effective. Can you talk about like what is actually effective about like? Yeah conservatives should be fighting that battle, right? Mm -hmm. It's a battle worth fighting because it's a battle that we could win. Yes. Because we can actually convert people if we do it right. Yes. What worked on you? So it was a bunch of different things. Like I said, it was kind of just the main part was realizing how much I didn't know. Yeah. So then I kind of had a blank slate of like, okay, I can go from here and there's a lot that I have to learn about the actual way that our government works. A lot about American exceptionalism that I didn't know. A lot of the stats that you were reading in the last segment were very interesting because I think that people have such a strong view about the state of our country or different issues without knowing um, what's actually going on, what the place of government is in our lives. And so that's easily broken down. Um, I think that content that really just shows you the stats, the information with very little opinion, that is super effective. You see a bunch of these Instagram accounts and content creators really just focusing on getting the information in front of people. I think people are sick of just hearing opinions about something. They just actually want to know the facts and then you can fill in the opinion from there. Um, what I will say too is that I really fought on my beliefs for a while. It was not like I woke up and I saw one thing or the other that changed my mind. It right. was just the planting of the seeds that ended up growing. So if you're having a debate with somebody, if you're having a conversation and you feel like you are making no traction at all in getting them to see your viewpoint, chances are you are more than you think is being effective. Um, it just takes people time, um, especially time away from people where they don't think that they have to just win the argument or win right. the debate, where then they are able to internalize that information that they're receiving. Um, another aspect of that, on top of just the basic information I was learning was, um, have you ever watched a leftist cringe compilation? 
yeah. these crazy people yeah. screaming on the streets. Yeah. So oh, yeah. um, I had a friend who I went to a very small liberal high school with. We all knew each other very well. And she was in one. And so she posted this video. It was Kat Timpf interviewing her. And it was um, her on the streets of New York City for um, a protest. And she was just out there screaming very vile things, very disgusting things. And very nasty, nasty Yeah, and she posted there. it was like, I am part of this liberal cringe compilation. I love making these white men cringe. And she was just boasting about it. And I, so I watched it and I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's really like, bizarre. This it's like is they how get this I weird kind of like, people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're weird kind of like masochists who yes. get off on being, you know, just unenjoyable yeah. and unimpressive. Right. Hey, great to have you. Thank you. Uh, you brought up Cat Temp. Do you know where you can see Cat Temp? America Fest. America Fest. December 18th, December. 19th, 20th, so 21st. Yes. You can see all of us, plus Cat Temp, mm -hmm. Tucker Carlson, Candace Owens in Phoenix, Arizona. Use code CHARLIE for 25% off. And then stay tuned to watch The Spillover with Alex Clark right next. Thanks for joining us on TP Live. Bye-bye. We got one of the biggest badasses I think it's ever sat in this studio, Michael Chandler. We knew what we were going to get when it was me versus Justin Gaethje stepping into the cage. You want to fight on big stages against mm -hmm. big names with big, big opportunities, big implications on the line. And Madison Square Garden is that big venue. Mm -hmm. I'm warming up in the same locker room as Muhammad Ali. Yep. I'm walking the same walk out to the battlefield as Mike Tyson. The whole week just felt like we were about to embark on something truly historic. A lot of people have just compared this to maybe like a Rocky Balboa fight. Mm -hmm. It was an absolute war out there, just trading punches. Whether you're fighting for a title or not, uh, people are gonna tune in now to watch my fights for sure. Justin Gaethje limped to his, he limped to his, his <laughs> ambulance, I limped to mine. We ended up in hospital beds right next to each other. We're gonna look back 20 years from now and say, man, that this was the biggest fight of my life possibly, you know? You have so much respect for the guy that you share the octagon with because without a dance partner, you can't make magic. told you about the first time I met Charlie Kirk in person? I was finishing up my interview process with Turning Point USA and they invited me backstage at YWS in 2019 to meet him officially. And this blonde chick sits down next to him and she starts picking through his salad and taking out all the croutons. I was in shock. I was like, okay, this guy is such a big deal that his assistant happily just picks through his salad and then he eats it wild. Then all of a sudden, he sits down next to her and she kisses his cheek. I was so confused and concerned. I was like, oh my gosh, I just witnessed a crazy HR violation. Little did I know that girl was Erica, Charlie's now wife. And at the time, they were secretly dating. So I had no clue until that point that he even had a girlfriend. I mean, he didn't post about it online and stuff. So I can't guarantee that you'll get to pick through Charlie Kirk's salad backstage at America Fest, but I can guarantee that not only only will you get to see Charlie speak on the biggest stage we've ever had at a Turning Point USA event. You'll also get to hear from people like Tucker Carlson, Kaylee McEnany, Candace Owens, Don Jr., and more. Plus, you will be front row for two nights of country concerts with stars like Brantley Gilbert, Russell Dickerson, and Ray Lynn. America Fest is December 18th to the 21st in Phoenix, Arizona. Secure your ticket now by going to tpusa.com slash America Fest and then use code code Alex for 25% off your ticket. What would you do if you stumbled upon a baby in a utility closet soaking within a bucket of formaldehyde? The baby is smaller than most newborns, but you can make out all of its features and its own unique anatomy. Then you hear something. Someone enters the closet and pushes past you. It's the janitor on duty, there to take the medical waste out with the trash. The janitor grabs the bucket with the baby soaking in formaldehyde and exits past you. What would you say? Would you stop him or her? Would you tell someone that there is an infant who was left to die alone, drenched in a chemical that burns the skin and is highly flammable? It is, of course, too late. It's clear that a murder has already been committed, but it's a murder that could have been prevented. In fact, it is perhaps the most preventable form of murder that exists today because most of the time it's committed against perfectly healthy preborn babies nestled in what should be the safest place on earth, a mother's womb. 
What I just described is an atrocity carried out, sometimes in plain sight, that often gets rebranded as women's rights and health care. Today's guest has a similar story to that little boy who was left soaking in formaldehyde. They were both victims of saline abortions and delivered in the same hospital, just one year apart. The exception is that our guest was delivered by her grandmother, a nurse at that hospital, who demanded that she be left alone to die when the abortion failed to kill her. Remember when I asked you if you saw a live baby in that situation, if you would say something? In the case of today's guest, nurses went against her grandmother's wishes to rescue her and she lived to tell the story that you're going to hear in a moment. Her name is Melissa Odin. Her story is crazy, way crazier than I can even tease right now, like way beyond what I just kind of said right there. So be prepared to be on the absolute edge of your seat. This is a goosebump-inducing episode if there ever was one. Melissa has spent her life dedicated to advocating for the voices of the unborn and those who were sentenced to die but lived. She's not only a wife, mother, and a pro-life advocate, but she's a master's level social worker and one of my favorite fun facts, founder and director of the Abortion Survivors Network, which is the only organization dedicated to abortion survivors. She is also the author of You Carried Me, A Daughter's Memoir. Please welcome Melissa Odin to The Spillover with me, Alex Clark. Melissa, I really want to dive right into the start of your life. What was your biological mother's background? How far along was she in her pregnancy? What made her want to get an abortion in the first place? My birth mother's experience is not as unique as what people would make it out to be. I now know that my birth mother was actually not given any other choice than to have an abortion. And we live in a world that calls it a choice and a right, but doesn't realize that many women identify feeling feeling pressured or coerced into their abortion. And so that was my birth mother's experience. Not only was it not her choice, Um, But she wasn't just coerced. She was literally forced against her will to have this saline infusion abortion. You know, here she was, a 19-year-old college student, and the very people who should have loved her, supported her, um, provided her true choices and support, were responsible for making sure the only choice was the door that led to St. Luke's Hospital in Sioux City, Iowa. She was not married to my biological father, and from what I've been told, that was just not convenient for her parents at the time because of their status in the community. And, you know, it's unfortunate because that still happens today. You know, very well-intentioned friends and family members and medical professionals and clergy can be responsible for coercing or forcing women to have abortions under circumstances like my birth mother's. Right. And so what the saline infusion abortion that you're talking about, explain what type of abortion that is. What happens in that type of abortion? Yeah, that procedure was the most common abortion procedure performed back in the 1970s. And it involved injecting a toxic salt solution into the amniotic fluid surrounding the preborn baby in the womb. The intent of that toxic salt solution was to then poison and scald the child to death. So typically procedure lasted about 72 hours. As the child was, as we would say, fortunate enough, their life was ended within the first 24 hours, and then they spent the next couple of days inducing labor with the intent of the deceased child being expelled from the womb. We actually know through my medical records that I didn't soak in the toxic salt solution for 24 hours or three days. I actually soaked in it for five. Whoa! They just kept trying time and time and again to induce my birth mother's labor, and I was just not budging. And so here I soaked in that toxic salt solution for even longer than the standards of the procedure. You know, in my medical records, it even indicates they they estimated my birth mother to be about 18 to 20 weeks pregnant. But the fact that I was ultimately born alive on the fifth day and I weighed almost three pounds tells the medical professionals that she was much further along. And in a little tiny corner of my medical records, it actually says I was probably about 31 weeks. Oh, my gosh. And so... That moment, you're born alive. Explain what's going on in what you know now. What happened in that um, doctor's office or in the in the hospital when you're born alive and then uh, your grandmother mm-hmm. actually tried to what? Explain what happened. 
Yeah, it's interesting having a story like this. Sometimes people will go, that can't happen. That doesn't happen. Well, it's happened to me, and I know it happens to children still today. So here they induced my birth mother's labor finally on the fifth day of the abortion procedure, believing that I would be delivered as a successful abortion. And that's the day that I was accidentally born alive. You have a birthday, right? Right. I have a day that I was accidentally born alive. Wow. That I now celebrate as my birthday. And there's something really different about that. The gravity of that is not lost on me. And I wish I could say, Alex, that when I was accidentally born alive in the final step of that abortion procedure, that all the medical professionals just jumped in and saw my dignity and value and provided me medical care. But everything we've heard from people like Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia about infanticide are very much true. I now know that I was laid aside for a period of time while there were arguments about whether I would be provided medical care. You can tell by looking at my medical records that within about five minutes, I was nearly dead. And we know at that hospital, children could ultimately wind up in the utility closet where they were placed in buckets of formaldehyde and left to die. As far as we know, I never made it to that closet, but I was laid aside. And the very person who told other nurses to leave me to die was my grandmother, as you started to connect to. And I was told initially that it was my abortionist who gave that demand, but now I know that it was my grandmother. She was a prominent nurse, oversaw the education of many of the nurses that even worked at that hospital. That's how she was able to force the abortion upon my birth mother. You know, she knew the ins and outs of that hospital. She had a lot of experience. She had a connection with the, the abortionist who worked there. Wow. And so she forced the abortion, monitored it at the hospital throughout those five days, coming face to face with me. I was her firstborn grandchild. She told the other nurses to leave me to die. And when they didn't let you die, did your grandmother know that you had been saved? Yeah, this is where it makes one of those Hollywood turns, right? Uh, you know, here I am nearly dead. There's arguments about whether I'll be provided medical care. And ultimately, we now know one nurse in particular rushed me off to the NICU. You know, I was born alive at a hospital. Most late-term abortions take place at hospitals, not because they intend to save children like me, but because of the greater risk to a woman's health um, that far along in a pregnancy for an abortion. But I was blessed that it was at a hospital because here this nurse rushed me off to the NICU, believing that if other people found out that the abortion had failed and a little girl had lived, that maybe they could provide medical care that would sustain my life. I know that because a nurse reached out to me after my first book came out. She was a nurse working in the NICU that day who was there when everything was happening. And she remembers all of the crazy things the nurse was saying about how the abortionist messed up. But ultimately, my grandmother followed her in. I didn't know that until just a few years ago. And I now know that my grandmother told all of those nurses to never tell my biological mother that I had survived that abortion. So your biological mother, who was how old at the time? 19. She was 19. She had no idea that that abortion had failed? Correct. So what happens in the minutes and even the days after you're born? Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? So my birth mother was told that day, you know, the abortion has been successful. It's hideous. It's a monster. Don't look at it. As I was in the room, she didn't know, Alex, if I was a little boy or a little girl. And so here she's in this devastating pain physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and then has to leave the hospital trying to pick up the pieces of her life, which, like so many women in that position, she spent decades then with incredible regret and suffering. And so here she tries to lead a normal life and her family keeps the secret of the abortion failing and me being placed for adoption. So while that is happening in her life, my life is really starting at that hospital. So, so then your grandma did know that you had survived. Oh, yeah. So how did she find out? When did they tell her, oh, by the way? Oops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can joke about that. It's OK. My life is full of a mo few moments where you can just go, wow, we really need to laugh about that now. Um, yeah, my birth mother didn't know that I had survived until I was about 30 years old. Oh, my gosh. This whole time she thought you were dead? Mm-hmm. 
Who told her that you were alive? Was it you? <laughs> was it you? It <laughs> was, sort of. I mean, in a roundabout way. Um, you know, I... I might I, be skipping in your story, so if I well, am, tell it's me. okay. We'll connect the dots together. When I started speaking in 2007 and sharing my story, I, you know, I had tried to find my biological mother before that because I wanted my birth parents to hear from me before I ever showed up on a show like this. And they kind of were traumatized by it. And I never could have realized that there was really no way people would tell her the truth. And so I had had a little bit of contact with her family and they made it clear that that my messages to her would not be passed along. And I felt like I still needed to come out and share this story with the world. And so here I didn't realize as I was starting to to speak out um, in defense of life that my birth mother's family would ultimately see me on a TV show. I've never named names until I really got my birth mother's blessing in recent years, but I didn't even have to name a name because they knew I look identical to my biological <gasps> father. And just from the very details of the abortion procedure and where I was born alive, they knew that it was me. And so that's how my birth mother found out. They saw me on TV, and I suspect they kind of panicked a little bit. And they finally told her that I was alive. Are all of you still living in the same area that you were born, her and you? Actually not. So I grew up in kind of a little town in Iowa, about two hours outside of where the abortion took place. And, you know, my medical records talked about the abortion taking place there, that my biological family was supposedly from there. But I always kind of thought, yeah, maybe they covered up some of those details. You know, this is one of those stories they don't want to share the whole story. Right. But um, she was not there when I finally found out who my biological parents were. But my, my birth father was there in Sioux City, Iowa, when I found him. So I started looking for my birth parents when I was about 19, that's how I can age myself really quickly with you because that's when the internet oh my came about. People, well, listen, Melissa, <laughs> people think that I'm way younger than I am. I'm almost 29, so I'm not like fresh out of college. A lot of people think I'm a lot younger. So I'm actually like way, I'm one of the oldest people that works at Turning Point USA. The average age of an employee here is like 23, 24. So I'm, I'm a little bit older. But I have to know then... Tell us about the moment that you find your birth mother and then you connect with her and then you talk with her. Mm -hmm. Where did this conversation take place? How did it take place? And what did you say and what did she say? Yeah, that's a long journey to have even gotten to her. So started looking for her when I was 19, found out who she was when I was 30. So, you know, here she's finding out that I survived her abortion. I'm finding out who she is. And you're the same age that she was when she tried to abort you. Everything's connecting, right? All of these little threads of her story and mine always fit together. And so we didn't really even start communicating for, gosh, man, almost seven years after that. So we didn't start communicating until 2013, you know, when she found out that the abortion had failed and I was alive, even though she was grateful, she was also really scared because... She was afraid that I could love her or forgive her, like I've always said that I do. Um, and for she somebody, was afraid that you could love her. She was afraid of me that whether I could really love her and f have forgiven her the way that I say that I do, because you know she really was not loved unconditionally at her home. Mm. Um, I didn't know that back then. And you know, for somebody like me who's led a pretty public life now, she kept thinking people are going to hate me mm. because they love her. And somehow I was responsible for this. And so she was deeply scared of, of me, unfortunately. And so we started communicating back in 2013. And that was only because another member of her family had reached out to me. My family and I moved to Kansas City. And what they had to tell me then is that I had moved to the very same community that she was living in. Oh, my gosh. So she's literally like in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I lived in Sioux City, Iowa, where my birth father was living at the time. So lived in the same city he was living in. Pack up and move to Kansas City for my husband's job. That's what I was thinking. Never could have I realized that's where my birth mother and one of my half sisters live. So that's how we started communicating. And 
Yeah, those were difficult, really difficult conversations to have, even by email. That's how it all started. So what did you say? The first email, your your biological mother, you've never spoken. Do you say, dear mom? <sighs> do you just address, do you, uh, what do you say in an email like that? Yeah, it's, it's so complicated. You know, I, I remember sharing my medical records with her because she had never received any copy of any record and she had tried over the years. And I'm thinking, how wild is this that the baby who survived the abortion has the records that the woman who had the abortion can't even obtain? Her mom like kept everything from her then. Mm -hmm. Is your grandmother still alive? She's not. So was she, uh, did she live long enough to know that you had connected with her? I think so. Um, well, her dad did anyway. You know, my, my grandmother probably passed away before she ever knew that I had connected with my birth mother. Um, but I hope that even for my grandfather, who's still alive, I hope that they find some, some peace and some encouragement with the fact that my birth mother and I are connected you know, how many times did other people try to really keep us separated? I mean, it's crazy when you look back on her history and mine. Yeah. So how long did you email back and forth before she was willing to meet in person? <laughs> you you want to hear how long it really was? Yeah. About three years. Wow. <laughs> and it, that was mostly, was it her that was apprehensive or both of you? I think both. I think you, in, in situations like this, I think you're both sitting on opposite sides of the computer and thinking, I care about this person. Right. I, I love them as a fellow human being. And I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to make them uncomfortable. I don't want to be weird. Um, I don't want to be rejected. You know, I've dealt with rejection so much in my life. She's dealt with rejection. And I think we were both just not knowing who was going to take the first step. And so, yeah, I was the first one that took the first step. About three years in, I emailed one of my half sisters who lives in that same metro area. And um, I had grown really close with her, too. And I just said, you know, I don't I don't want to make this weird, but I'm probably going to. So, <laughs> you know, I was just wondering if anybody would ever be interested in meeting. And, you know, I was on a flight when I sent that email and I immediately got a response back that said, yes, all in caps. We've been waiting. What did that feel like when you saw all caps? So enthusiastic. Just so much um, affirmation and encouragement. Yeah, there was never anything to be worried about. But there's no rule books, no playbooks for, for lives and stories like this. So, yeah, we quickly started to make plans to meet face to face. And, you know, we ended up meeting at a very public place. People always thought it was weird, but we met at a zoo. Wait, what animal were you in front of? <laughs> well, it was sort of by, uh, what are those? Sea lions? I think so. Oh, my gosh. I mean, how unique is this story? It could be a Lifetime movie. I met my <laughs> biological mother who tried to abort me in front of a sea lion. The whole thing is just, I feel like this is a, um, you remember Unsolved Mysteries? <laughs> this is a perfect, like, story for an Unsolved Mysteries episode. <laughs> so, okay, you meet. Do you hug? Do you shake hands? We hugged. I think it's so cool for me because now I get to take my kids back to that zoo. And, you know, every time I walk past that area where I first got the text from my half sister saying, hey, we're here. And part of me is thinking, well, I'm going to run away. You know, I know that I want to do this. I know it's the right thing to do. But, oh, my gosh, I don't think I'm going to survive this <laughs> emotionally. Right. And so now I get to walk past all of those points and remember it in a really fond way. But, yeah, I got the text that they were there and I could see them kind of in the distance. Did you think she looked like you? Uh, no, actually, if she was here, she would say she thinks I look like her. And there are <laughs> parts of me, but I would say I probably get my personality from her most definitely. But I really do look like my biological father. But, you know, we had exchanged photos and stuff over the years, so we definitely knew what one another looked like. But, yeah, meeting that person face to face, it's, I mean, it's exciting, but also it's like, yeah, it's panic. <laughs> so... Let me jump back to um, your life before this, before becoming a public speaker, be before becoming a pro-life activist mm -hmm. and sharing your story. Where were you living growing up? Because obviously you weren't living with your biological mother. So where were you at that point in your life? Yeah, I thought I led a pretty normal life growing up. So I grew up in a little town in Iowa. I grew up knowing I was adopted. Um, my adoptive parents adopted me knowing that I had survived this failed abortion. I was uh, essentially a special needs adoption. 
So they had been foster parents before they adopted my older sister, and then they adopted me. And then, um, you know, they they had my little brother biologically after 15 years of infertility. So adoption was just the normal fabric of our lives. So I grew up knowing those things. I didn't find out that I had survived that abortion until I was 14 years old. How did you find out? By an accident. You know, I now work with families around the world trying to help them navigate how and when and what to tell a child who has survived a failed abortion because, you know, I saw it in my parents' lives. They had nobody to turn to. They didn't, nobody talked about it. They didn't know that there were other people who survived abortions. They didn't know that there were other parents like them. And so they thought keeping it a secret was the right thing to do. And I think most parents would probably agree with that. And so here they keep it a secret. And when I'm 14, my older sister is facing an unplanned pregnancy as a high school (gasps) student. No way. Yeah. And as you can imagine, she felt like she had a choice to make. And when our parents found out that she was looking at it as having other choices besides life, um, they felt like they were supposed to tell her my story. And so that's ultimately how it came crashing down on me. My parents told my sister my story during an argument one night. She let it slip that she felt like she was more wanted by her biological parents than I was by mine. How did she say it? (laughs) Literally yelled at me. You know, at least my biological parents wanted me. I was thinking, (laughs) what? So then did you go run to your uh, foster parents or adoptive parents and ask them what the heck she was talking about? Yeah, I had to wait up for our mom. Um, Our mom was at work that night. And so, you know, waited hours having no idea what ultimately I would find out that night. I was really expecting to get yelled at by my mom for fighting with my sister. And, you know, here she ends up not yelling at me and having to really break my heart and hers. And so, yeah, that night she said, you know, Missy, your biological mother had an abortion during her pregnancy with you and you survived it. What were the immediate feelings you felt after hearing that from your adoptive mother? All these years later, there are really no words. I mean, I remember sitting on the couch that cold October night and it felt like a bomb had went off. Everything I thought I knew about myself suddenly wasn't true anymore. How could my biological parents have loved me if they attempted to end my life through an abortion? And who was I anymore? I mean, so I'm an adoptee, but I'm also somebody who survived an abortion. What is that? And who is that? And, you know, every emotion, the anger and the resentment and the guilt for surviving when I knew tens of millions of children weren't as fortunate And, you know, the shame and embarrassment because we live in a culture that calls what happened to be someone else's choice and right to make. And I even struggled with the concept of being a feminist. You know, at the age of 14, I was a conservative and I identified myself as a feminist. And suddenly when I found out my story, I was thinking, uh, well, I can still be a conservative, obviously. But can I be a feminist anymore? Because the rest of the world would tell me that I can't be. Before 14 years old, had you ever even learned about or heard about pro-life versus pro-choice? Yeah, especially, you know, in school. I went to a public school and certainly even, you know, in my life at the time, there were people having abortions in my school when I was 14 years old. So none of it was surprising to me. But when it hits that close to home, it absolutely changes everything. So did you immediately start looking into what it means to be pro-life versus pro-choice? Did, did it? Did you really become passionate about the topic of abortion at 14 years old? Talk about growing into the activist that you now are. Yeah. I don't know if other activists can relate to what this is like. You know, I started out, yes, you know, I mean, even though I really, it took me years to heal and grow stronger, you know, I immediately started speaking about it at my school, gave a speech on on my experience. Really? In high school? Actually, it was like eighth grade. And, you know, it's so funny because still today I'll get emails from people who were in that class and they'll say, I'll never forget how you left a chair empty that day (gasps) because I was trying to give them that depiction of this is what life would look like if that abortion had been successful. I wouldn't be here. Oh, my gosh. That is very good. I mean, visuals for an eighth grader to think to do that. So that's how it all started. But then I went away to college. And I got the message loud and clear very quickly that I needed to be quiet. Mm. 
And I think maybe other people can relate to that. So I went to a pretty, you know, a fairly large public university. There was no pro-life student group group on campus. And, you know, the few times that I would share my story, it was, you know, the comments from people who I thought were my friends, you know, they'd say things like, (laughs) you know, just because that happened to you doesn't mean you need to talk about it. And just because that happened to you, it doesn't mean you need to be pro-life. And I think one of the most difficult college experiences for me was, you know, here I had this professor who was really supportive of me. I thought he was going to help me really get into a PhD program. And I was in a a personality of psychology class, and you were supposed to write about how you became the person that you are. Ding. That's a pretty easy one for me to write about. This is this is who I am. And so here I wrote about surviving this abortion. And when I got my paper back, he had written all over it. He gave me an A because I deserved it. But he wrote all over it saying, uh, who would have told you such a thing? These things don't happen. He didn't believe what? That abortions happen or that people can survive an abortion? That people can survive an abortion. And that's when I started to be quiet for quite a while because I didn't know that there were a population of other people like me and I needed to heal and I needed to find a place that I could grow stronger and find my voice. And so really it took me, you know, entering into my own career as a social worker and, you know, working to find my biological parents and find my medical records and uh, find my own voice. And that's why I came forward when I did. What was that moment like when you met your mother and what was it that you saw in her eyes that haunted you for so long? Hmm. That's one of those things that makes me emotional. When I met her that day, my half sister was holding her hand and, you know, essentially kind of placed her hand in mine. And that was so meaningful to me because I'm essentially I'm the oldest sister in a family of three on my birth mother side of the family. And so for my sister, who's always been there for her and didn't always know the story for her to kind of, you know, give her to me that day meant a lot. And, you know, when we we hugged that day, my birth mom said, you know, I never got to hold you. Talk about rip your heart out. And um, that's how our day started. And we spent really the day together trying to, you know, start to answer some questions and, and yet be, you know, as normal as we can. I mean, that's our struggle all the time is to be a normal family in pretty abnormal circumstances. But I'll never forget the look in her eyes that day, Alex. I um. I've worked with wounded people all my life, essentially, as a social worker. And um, the amount of suffering in her eyes, I will just never forget it. And if there's one thing about my life I could honestly change, that is the one thing I would do. I would fix her pain. I wouldn't prevent this from happening to me. This is obviously who I am. This was the purpose for me. But if I could take away her pain, I would do it in a heartbeat. I am curious, going through a botched abortion, has that caused any health issues for you in your life? What are the, what are the, um, I guess, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but the outcome, what's the outcome of that? Right. That's okay. People always kind of look at me and go, oh, is there something wrong with her that we can't see? You know, that's what people used to say about me. <laughs> It's okay. And you're like, well, I would be like a lot. (laughs) Right. It depends on the day. Uh, You know, when I was first rushed off to the NICU, I did have a lot of health issues. So severe respiratory liver problems, seizures. They thought I had a fatal heart defect just because of the amount of distress I presented with. Uh, They thought I would suffer from multiple disabilities. But you know what? By and large, I am pretty healthy. My one kind of claim to fame that I find in our population of abortion survivors is I've had shingles like 12 times. Why do you think that is? Oh, we know why that is. You know, the doctors will tell you it's because, you know, first of all, babies in the womb experience the stress that their mothers go through. So think about my birth mother and all the stress she was going through. Then children like me, we experience the stress of an abortion procedure in utero. So think about being poisoned and scalded for five days. I'm pretty sure my body and everything was off the charts. Then you're born alive and people don't provide you medical care. And then you spend time in the NICU. So my body experienced multiple, multiple, multiple stresses. And 
So I find this with survivors. We are just constantly, we are born into stress. We are functioning under stress in a world that says we don't exist and champions what happened to us. And so that's how it manifests itself is, you know, a lot of survivors have chronic pain, chronic fatigue, a lot of immune system issues. Yes, some survivors are missing limbs, have, you know, burn marks or, you know, paralysis, those kind of things. But most of us carry kind of these invisible long-term complications. Are one of the invisible complications that you've dealt with just in an emotional sense, knowing that your own grandmother wanted you dead? Most definitely. Um, that's hard for people to hear. I know that it is. You know, for me, I'm a person of faith. And so my faith is absolutely what has allowed me to persevere in the face of it and to forgive my grandmother and my abortionist. You know, I forgave my birth parents first when I was a teenager, not knowing what their whole story is. Um, but I have to forgive people time and time again, the more that I find out in my life. And I don't have any regrets about that. What is your relationship like with your adoptive family and your biological family now? Do you guys all mingle together? What What is your life like? So my adoptive parents, so mom and dad, you know, sometimes people hear me speak and they go, oh, do you call them a, your adoptive parents all the time? No, that's for descriptive purposes. Right. They are just mom and dad. Um, you know, they actually haven't met my birth mother yet, mainly just from a logistics standpoint. And um, but they're so supportive of my birth mother and she is supportive of them. You know, my birth mother would say I was meant to be their child. That's where I was supposed to be. You know, she has always said she doesn't think that her family really would have given me any chance to be loved and supported by them. And that, you know, that gives me some some grief um, just because it shouldn't have to be that way. But I acknowledge and I respect the fact that that's how my birth mother sees it, that that's the way it was supposed to be. And, um, you know, my mom and dad are my mom and dad. And, um, you know, I love that that they love and respect my birth mom. And, you know, I'm constantly passing along messages, you know, mom and dad say hi, you know, and, and then I'll say hi back to them from from Ruth. And yeah, it's um, I'm really blessed. I think you are, too. I have been pro-life my entire life. Um, grew up in a very conservative Christian home. My mom was very vocally pro-life. It was something we always talked about. I never went through a period where I ever thought that abortion was acceptable. However, m being someone that has been in the pro-life movement my entire life, I have never, until your story, heard of someone surviving an abortion, actually. And so I'm curious are you just a one in a million case? <laughs> How often does this happen? Um, you actually started a organization, um, if you want to talk about that and what you do and what you do with other survivors of abortion. Yeah, trust me, I am not that special. You know, uh, I may be, yeah, you know, in the face of 70 million lives lost, the number of survivors pales in comparison. But we know statistically there are probably tens of thousands of people like me there's a great uh, a resource called the Dreaded uh, Complication Series. It was published in the Philadelphia Inquirer back in 1981. If you haven't ever read it, super great resource. In it, uh, Dr. Willard Cates of the CDC talked about how they identified 400 to 500 live births a year from failed abortions. I've done the math. At this point in nearly 49 years of legalized abortion, that puts us at nearly 20,000 abortion survivors in the United States alone. I've seen statistics as high as 44,000 that people have um, gleaned from looking through failure rates of late-term abortions in particular. And I can tell you, Alex, that children survive abortions still today, even from chemical abortions. And I'm not just talking about abortion pill reversal. I'm talking about both chemical abortion pills being taken and babies still surviving both pills. What typically happens or what is supposed to happen in a state if a baby is born alive after an abortion? Because you, like you brought up, Governor Northam, you know, he was saying bizarre stuff, essentially, like talking about infanticide. So what happens? Well, bizarre, but also very real. So, you know, 2019 was really interesting with aggressive abortion legislation and then all of this talk of infanticide. And then we started to see born alive legislation popping up more and more. And I've testified, you know, a number of times, both before Congress and in various states uh, for born alive legislation and other other laws. But 
you know, there are only right now, I believe, nine states who report out their born alive survivors. And that is, you know, just a slight increase than what we've seen in other years. And, you know, in those nine states, we are seeing hundreds of children surviving failed abortions that they're reporting out. Um, Texas had six in one year. Minnesota had three. I mean, Florida is another one. The list could go on and on. Those are the ones that they're even just reporting out. Uh, the Minnesota report is pretty interesting because if you read through it, they're one of the few states that also identifies whether a child is provided medical care. Of those three children in one year, none of them were provided medical care. So that means should they just leave them there to die? Well, they use, you know, the fancy terms like, uh, you know, that they were provided um, comfort care. Which is what uh, Northam had said. Right. So when you're saying we're going to lay the baby aside and a conversation will happen between the doctor and the mother about what kind of care will take place. And, you know, I see this in other states, too, when I'm testifying. We don't talk about how induction of labor is a very real thing. So they it, talk about it at the hospital. We're going to induce labor. OK, you're going to induce labor. And then what? Inducing labor isn't just sometimes inducing labor. It's also inducing labor early on, believing that the child won't survive that preterm labor or they're not going to survive long after they're born. And so, yes, children are also then laid aside, left to die under those purposes. What have you found with survivors of abortion? Are they typically adopted out or are do their biological mothers decide, actually, I want to keep this baby? Yeah, so I am this walking encyclopedia of abortion survivor information, which is great <laughs> because uh, we live in a world that needs it. When I first got involved in the pro-life movement, I only knew of a couple people. And now we've connected with 403 abortion survivors over at the Abortion Survivors Network. But we know, again, there's tens of thousands. Um, you know, most of those survivors are actually raised in their biological family and not placed for adoption. That first surprised me based on my own experience. But you know, it makes sense, doesn't it, when we know that the child is never really the problem? Mm -hmm. It's the circumstances someone is going through. It makes sense that then the child is raised in their biological family. And that's how most survivors learn their story, not because it's in a medical record or an adoption file. Yes, that does happen. But most are told their story through their biological family. Do most abortion survivors have any physical defects or anything or or you would never know by looking at them? Most of us, you would never know. So, yes, from time to time, you will see survivors uh, and you'll actually see a survivor really soon in a super cool ad with uh, the Susan B. Anthony list related to the Dobbs uh, oral arguments case. So one of the survivors that have gone through the programs of healing and uh, education and, and speakers training and all of these things and found relationships that have really empowered her, she uh, was able to take part in an ad with them and looking at at her, you would not ever know that she survived what she did, but she has mild cerebral palsy, hearing loss. So we do tend to find uh, some of those issues in our population also. What type of abortion did she survive? You know what? I don't even know if we know through her medical records. It talks about it happening at about 28 weeks. I can't remember if she's a vacuum aspiration abortion. But, you know, that's what we also find is that so many survivors are born alive because they're much further along gestationally than what well, the abortionist thought. I was told, Melissa, that late term abortions <laughs> never happen or rarely ever. Right. I am so special that it only happened to me. How often are those actually happening? Oh, we won't ever have the statistics on it because they don't want us to know. But I can tell you that of the survivors in our network, so many are told, oh, that baby isn't, you know, any further along than 18 to 20 weeks. And whoops, they're 24 or they're 28 or they're 31. But, you know, I think the other thing that our culture really needs to get a grasp on is it's not just late term abortions that babies survive. They're surviving first trimester abortions, second trimester abortions. One of my team members, so most of my team at the Abortion Survivors Network survived abortions. Really? Oh, yeah. That's how we roll. <laughs> that. So one of my team, her name's Denisha, and actually she lives here in Arizona. Yes. She survived two chemical abortions and a follow-up DNC. She did not know that she survived an abortion until 2019. She's like 47. 
And how did she find out? I mean, if it's, you know, just to summarize. Yeah, she won't mind me sharing her story. So, you know, when New York lit up the Trade Towers pink in support of expanding abortion through all nine months, she felt like she was supposed to reach out to her dad, her biological dad, who she didn't have a lot of relationship and communication with over the years. But she felt like she was supposed to reach out to him and ask if her mom had ever considered having an abortion. Her mom had passed away many, many years ago. So she reaches out to her dad and says, hey, you know what? I feel like I'm supposed to ask you, did mom ever think about this? Yeah, not only did she think about it, but she actually did it. Holy crap. Yeah. We have survivors, too, who have had abortions themselves. You know, sometimes it's after they know their story because they have experience so much trauma and they're not, you know, they're not prevented from being coerced and forced to abort. But sometimes survivors have abortions before they even know their story. I mean, think about the trauma that happens for them after they find out. So it is possible that if you are someone who has had an abortion, that you can still be pro-life later. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of my team, I mean, I love talking about my team, One of my team members is Priscilla. She lives in Alaska. She's 71. You would never know it in a million years. And uh, I want to be like Priscilla as I grow up. But Priscilla survived an illegal abortion, was raised in her biological family, had an abortion at the age of 19. And that's when her mom told her that she had attempted to abort her. Priscilla went on and had another abortion when she was in her 20s. And then like so many women, After all of that trauma, she went to work in the abortion clinic wanting to give women something that she didn't find there, which Mm -hmm. was support. And of course, then her life has turned around dramatically, you know, because uh, she became a person of faith and she's now been able to heal in so many of those different areas of her life. And I just love her so much and her courage in sharing her story as difficult as it is. So you brought up that Priscilla felt like she wanted to provide something that she didn't feel like she had when she was in crisis. What is your response when people say that pro-lifers only are pro-birth? We don't care about baby until, you know, except when they're in the womb. (laughs) We care more about women and children after they've been born than the abortion industry and lobby ever will. And uh, it doesn't take long at all to look at the pro-life movement and see that from pregnancy centers to people out on the sidewalk to, you know, other pro-life organizations. Yeah, we we talk about being pro-life as being pro-woman and pro-child and we mean it and we know it. Um, And that's what makes me proud to be in this movement. We don't just care about children like me. We care about women like my birth mother. The organization that you started is the Abortion Survivors Network. Talk about the really special work that you guys do. Yeah, we're the only organization worldwide that serves abortion survivors and even families who need to be healed. You know, think about both sides of my family, adoptive and biological, and how they were impacted by this failed abortion, and they didn't have anybody to turn to to help them. So, yeah, we run healing groups uh, multiple times a year. We just did an in-person retreat uh, early this year, where we had 17 abortion survivors there. We'll oh probably gosh. have 30 next year. And this is a nonprofit? We are. We're a nonprofit. Uh, and think about that. We are the nonprofit made up of and serving the very people that the abortion industry tried to kill. We're up against the very giant who tried to take our lives. So we offer healing support. We do um, community and peer support. So we even get together once a month with abortion survivors from as far away as Sri Lanka, Africa. I mean, it is amazing oh, so to cool. see people lay eyes on someone who's just like them. Uh, we also do education groups. So we train survivors how to share their story. That's really cool. It is really cool, isn't it? And over the summer, we launched uh, six survivors publicly with their story for the first time. So people can visit our YouTube channel. It's just the Abortion Survivors Network. And you can find seven minute clips from these survivors sharing their stories. And it is like for me, it is so impactful, even though I know them, I'm blown away every time I hear them speak. So we're training people on how to speak publicly, how to advocate And we're ultimately getting them involved in major campaigns like the one you will see soon. It's been 49 years of legalized abortion, and there's never been an organization like us. And it's long past time that people are healed and supported, but also then that our culture needs to come face to face with us. 
Talk about the upcoming Supreme Court case, why this one may arguably be even more important to the issue of abortion than Roe v. Wade. Absolutely. You know, if people have been paying attention, you'll see that we're talking a lot in the movement about how we know everything that we do now about, you know, the science of the baby in the womb, ultrasound, all of these things. And, you know, we also know that viability is, you know, (laughs) much earlier than what they ever wanted it to be. I mean, I've gosh, I was in the Oval Office uh, when Trump was in office and I was with a little boy who had been born at like 21 weeks. Mm. So we know the viability is is, you know, earlier and earlier. So, you know, we know all these things to be true since uh, Roe was, you know, essentially settled. What that's what they're trying to say. Right. Oh, this is settled. No, it's far from settled. Um, So we know that all of these things are are true and different than what they were back in 1973. Uh, And we know that, you know, women don't need abortion to be able to be successful. I frankly find that demeaning every time I hear it. Uh, and as a woman who survived an abortion, the very act that was mo- most, you know, supposed to end my life, that's now my right to exercise and is supposed to be empowering to me. That's ridiculous. So we know that this court case is incredibly important. And I do truly believe no matter what happens with the Texas ruling right now, I think we have a great likelihood of the court realizing the truth that, you know, Roe was... <sighs> Roe has devastated our lives, and it is not a constitutionally protected right. And so what is this case called, um, and what will it determine, or what could it determine? Yeah, so the oral arguments are on December 1st, and so you'll find it as uh, Dobbs versus Jackson Whole Women's Health, I think is the in, uh, the complete uh, description of that. And so that was headed up really by Mississippi Attorney General Lynn Fitch, who is just a rock star, in my opinion. She makes me want to go to law school. Uh, it's it's just a brilliant brief, uh, first and foremost. But it was based on Mississippi's law that was, uh, you know, really banning abortion at 15 weeks. And so that's when the court was stepping in and saying, whoa, that's completely unconstitutional. Well, let's challenge that. Let's have a real talk about the humanity of preborn children in the womb and the realities that women face. And so that's really what's teed up those oral arguments on December 1st. People aren't allowed into the court to hear those arguments because of COVID protocols, but they are going to be playing those arguments out into the general square. There's a big rally. You will see me there along with lots of other pro-life leaders. I should have the opportunity to give some remarks that day. I have a lot to say. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I'm excited. That's freaking cool. Okay, so you also are a mother now, which is so amazing. And you were kind of telling me about your daughter is 13. And you were kind of describing she's a little cute servative. She is. I mean, I hope she is cool with me saying that. Liv, you are. I mean, you you are. You know that you are. She is outstanding to be 13 years old. And, you know, she's not afraid to be uh, bold about who she is and what we believe and not back down and, and knows that, you know, our conservative beliefs are worth fighting for and that we're right. And so, um, yeah, she goes to a lot of pro-life movement, you know, activities with me. She you know, used to fall asleep at my feet at podiums when I was giving speeches. So she's just been raised in the movement and out on the sidewalk. And, uh, you know, she plans on running for office someday. She wants to run for Congress. She plans on going to law school and studying politics. And, you know, I was sharing that I was at her conferences recently. And, you know, one of her teachers said she's just one of those kids where where she leads, other people just naturally follow And they went so far as to say that, you know, they saw her as the next Condoleezza Rice. And that's, I mean, that's life complete for me right there. That's your girl. That's my girl. How do you prep her to be able to debate the topic of abortion at 13 years old with a mother who is a staunch pro-life activist? How does she deal with that in today's culture I cannot imagine what types of conversations she has as a middle schooler right now. Yeah, that's what I love about her. She really is so much more bold than I could be at that point in my life. And I was looking through old Facebook memories the other day. And so I did an ad with the Susan B. Anthony list back in 2012 called How Will You Answer? Uh, And that was about then Senator Barack Obama's infanticide history. And 
she was raised, you know, she was pretty little, but she was growing up as it was happening. And through an old Facebook memory, she said, you know, I, why does that, uh, or Barack Obama, why does he think it's okay <laughs> to kill babies in abortion and leave them to die? I mean, she was like five years old and she was saying that. Out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we go from there to now being 13 and, you know, she just brings up to people, you know, not only the tenets of our faith, but also the science of when life begins. And I, I love that she is able to include, you know, women's rights. And if people want to go there, she talks about the rights of her mother and her own right as a young woman who never would have lived if the abortion would have been successful in ending my life. You know, she knows enough pro-life leaders to say, you know, if somebody brings up rape, she can talk about, yeah, and what about their life? And, you know, do those circumstances change the the value of that person's life? Does it ever make it OK? So it's just it's cool to really equip her to have those conversations. Talk about the gift of motherhood and um, just talk about that for a lot of the younger members of my audience or women that are like, I don't know if I want to have kids or, you know, culture tells me that I need to fulfill my own dreams. I need to do me, 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 you know, and not pour into somebody else. Talk about just what a gift motherhood has been for you. I've been able to do it all. You know, leave a job as a social worker, get involved in the pro-life movement. You know, I speak, <laughs> I speak so much, so frequently. I'm constantly in and out of airports, uh, raising money for other organizations in my own, going and testifying before Congress. My children have never held me back. What they have done is give me something worth fighting for mm. because this is my legacy to them and to the world. And on the days that get hard, you know, I have a I have a note in my bag that's here with me today. It's a picture from my seven-year-old, and it's her and I, and it says, I miss you, Mom. Aww. You know what? Yes, it somewhat breaks my heart that I have to be away from her. But at the same time, she is living her life knowing that this was a sacrifice Mom makes. This is a sacrifice our family makes, and it's always worth it. And so our culture has really you know, strewn that lie that to be a successful woman you have to choose between a career and being a mother. And I say, no way. And I know so many other mothers who are just as successful. And I wouldn't have it any other way. This is like, this is the women's empowerment feeling that I feel like they try to pretend that you get if you go to something like the Women's March or whatever. But I'm feeling it now with you, Melissa. Like, this is, I feel so encouraged and excited about just my future one day, hopefully, God willing, that I'll get to be a mother. And just you, your story and your family makes me so absolutely excited and just so happy for you. And I don't even know you, but I just am so elated. Just everything you're describing. I do want to know for anyone listening, just like your biological mother who was forced to have an abortion or, you know, attempt to have one for anyone else who has gone through that, where they felt like they had no choice, their family was pressuring them. They had a boyfriend that was pressuring them or whatever to have an abortion. Um, and maybe it was successful or not, but what would you as an abortion survivor want them to know? And even if it was their quote unquote choice to have that abortion at the time, you know, the the answer is still the same. You are loved. You are forgiven. Uh, there are so many healing res resources out there from local pregnancy centers to groups like support after abortion, surrendering the secret, hurt by abortion. You know, that list could go on and on of the organizations that people can turn to for help. And you know, no matter what our culture says, um, about how it's a choice and a right and that you shouldn't feel guilty or any of those things. We know that that is indeed what women face. And so you are not alone in that and turn to places for help and for hope. What are your favorite, besides Abortion Survivors Network, obviously, <laughs> what are your other favorite nonprofit uh, pro-life organizations for people to get involved in if they want to do something for the pro-life movement? I get asked this question every time I talk about abortion. Ooh, there are so many good ones. Uh, you know, Abby Johnson and the team over at Pro Love Ministries, Abby's a good friend of mine. Pro Love Ministries is uh, a fairly new uh, nonprofit. So they do affiliates. So the Abortion Survivors Network is an affiliate. So they help us really become a new startup and and get started in the pro-life movement, um, even though we've existed for a long time. But as a startup, you've got things to do. But they help other organizations really start to grow and fill in gaps in the pro-life movement. But they also have one of their own organizations under that umbrella called Love Lines. 
And if people aren't following that, it's a great resource when women are facing crises in their lives. Um, they really do case management and help meet those needs, help them, you know, navigate systems to meet those needs that it could be driving them to abortion. So Lovelines is an incredible place to turn to. And I'm a big fan of of the Susan B. Anthony list, um, the Charlotte Lozier Institute I work with a lot. Local pregnancy centers are saving lives every single day, and they always need support. Yes. My favorite thing, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Allie Stuckey. And Allie does something really cool just for her birthdays and holidays and stuff. She always comes up with a pro-life list on Amazon, like a wish list or whatever, a registry, Mm -hmm. and finds a different pro-life center in the United States and then just encourages people to buy things off their registry and donate to the pro-life center. And she'll post pictures, share pictures from the pro-life centers of like hundreds and hundreds of Amazon boxes of all the supplies that pro-life people have bought for them, you know, that they can't even fit in the door. It's like they're having to buy extra storage for it and everything. And, you know, that's when I think of people saying we're only pro-birth. I'm just like, I've seen the evidence, you know, (laughs) like whatever. But um, you have some really exciting stuff uh, happening soon coming up in the new year. So I want to know about that. Yeah. So I have one book out right now called You Carried Me a Daughter's Memoir. And my second book is coming out sometime next year. Pub date is kind of fluid at this point. We haven't announced who the publisher is, but I can tell you it's a major Christian publisher, and I'm working with a major Christian author who's a best-selling writer. And the working title right now is More Than a Choice, Abortion Survivors Break Their Silence. (gasps) Ooh, yes. Uh, I think that's a good choice. And so, yeah, keep that title, publishers, if you're listening. Um, (laughs) We're feeling it. We're feeling it. I got goosebumps. (laughs) But I'm telling about uh, 10 other abortion survivor stories who have never been public before. Some of them are little. One of them is actually a young child under the age of 10 from here in Arizona. No way. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I'm very, very stoked for this. And so when does this book come out tentatively? Can you give us that? I don't know yet. Okay. It may not be until the fall. It really is the pandemic. Mm. Yeah. But for sure, 2022. Oh, yes. Okay. That isn't changing. So it's going to be an incredible book. And um, I'm excited about that. We've never had one like that in the pro-life movement. And I think it's a great opportunity when people want to go, oh, there's like one of them or two of them. No, first of all, here's a book full of them, and I'm going to work really hard to find the rest of the people whose stories are untold. I want to know when the when the Melissa Odin movie is going to come out. Abby Johnson got, you know, uh, unplanned. When's your movie coming? Are you going to get one? Maybe. There's also something in the works before that. So a documentary uh, that we're... We're kind of working on the fundraising for at this point. Okay. So, well, wait. If people want to get involved with that, what, where can they find that to help? That's They can contact us directly at the Abortion Survivors Network. Um, again, it's somebody with a proven track record of major pro-life documentaries. Uh, I wish I could name names. He probably wouldn't mind, but I should probably not. Right. But people can contact us at the Abortion Survivors Network. Um, you know, it's about 150000 to maybe make that a reality. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's a game changer. Absolutely. Um, Okay, so where else can people find you? Where can they follow you on social media and all that good stuff? Yeah, you weren't expecting that part, were you? I wasn't. Documentary first, and then that will lead to my life story. That's that's what they've laid out. They can find us uh, at the Abortion Survivors Network. So we are abortionsurvivors.org. Find us on, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at the Abortion Survivors Network. Melissa, you're like one of the coolest chicks I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. Thank you so much for coming on The Spillover today. Thank you. I can't say it enough. Melissa's entire story is why I fight for life. It's why conservatives fight for life. It's why all of us fight for life. She has impacted so many people because she survived. And it just makes me think of what sort of world we'd be living in right now had there never been a single abortion. What change might those lives have had on human history? Just really makes you think. I always say the phrase, it's brave season as a way to encourage you to share your conservative or pro-life beliefs. Melissa's story is an awesome way to start the conversation about life. Just share this episode on social media or text it to a friend and be like, did you know that there are people out there who survive almost being aborted? I never have. And this woman's story is nuts. you got to listen to this. If they're pro-choice, I bet you that person would say that they're all for women's rights, right? Well, 
Melissa's a woman, a wife, a working mom, a social worker, an all-around rock star. They should believe in her right to life, too, and listen to what she has to say. If you're hearing from me for the first time, you should know that besides The Spillover, I have a daily show on Instagram that's uh, a few minutes every single day where I cover the daily pop culture and entertainment news from a conservative perspective. The show is called Poplitics, and we just celebrated our two-year anniversary. It's on Instagram. Every day, I spill the conservatee, as I like to call it. And then every Friday, I share the conservatee that I can't fit in a politics episode on this show, which is why it's called The Spillover. The goal and purpose of The Spillover is to share mind-blowing stories and interviews with some of the most interesting people and storytellers in the world. Even if you aren't conservative, I know without a shadow of a doubt that you will love these stories and guests because it's stuff that you won't hear on any other podcast. First-hand accounts and survival stories, experts in the juiciest, most controversial topics like teen girls with gender dysphoria and even relationship advice. Every week is totally different. So make sure you subscribe to Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, Just search for The Spillover, subscribe on there. And if you like the show and you want us to keep growing, leave us a five-star review. I cannot tell you how much that helps the show and episodes. I'm Alex Clark and this is The Spillover. Love you, mean it, bye. Yo, it's John Root, I'm, I'm back. I know I told you in the open of the show that that's the only time you're gonna see me. I lied, I'm sorry. Hope you've enjoyed the live stream so far. Coming up next on TV USA Live, tune into the newest episode of Poplitics, where the always entertaining Alex Clark will show you disturbing footage from pro-abortion activists, a shocking CIA cover-up, she shares her freak of the week, and so much more pop culture without the propaganda, next on Poplitics. Hello? Are you pooping? Hello? I know you're pooping. It smells good. Bye bye now. I looked so long for the perfect video to open the show with and when I saw that, it was love at first. That's because you're mentally unstable. Today on the show, the demonic act that pro-choicers took this week to protest abortion rights. The CIA has been caught covering up pedophiles within their own organization. And we get another Freak of the Week. I'm Alex Clark, and this is Poplitics. Want to see someone possessed with demons in public? Abortion! Abortion! Pills! Pills! Forever! Forever! Abortion! Abortion! Pills! Pills! Forever! Woo! 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 This is why it's hard for me to understand mushy middle conservatives on the issue of life. How can you say that you're pro-choice technically for X, Y, or Z reason when you know their movement is radicalized by people who experience joy while they purposefully murder their babies? The woman on the far left is smiling. She's ecstatic. This isn't normal. This is the celebration of death. If you or someone you know has taken an abortion pill but you regret it and it's been within 72 hours, you can actually reverse your abortion. Save this number in case you or someone you know ever needs it. 585-633-8883. I'm here for you. I know 
you know how corrupt our government is, but the latest example this week is perhaps the most disturbing. It's right up there with the FBI intentionally dragging their feet on the USA Gymnastics sexual abuse cover up. I don't see how it could get any worse. Well, old man, you're about to. Over the past 14 years, the CIA has secretly held on to credible evidence that at least 10 of its own employees and contractors sexually abused children. What the is wrong with you? According to a BuzzFeed News investigation where they were granted access to reports through Freedom of Information Act lawsuits, they said, though most of these cases were referred to U.S. attorneys for prosecution, only one of the individuals was ever charged with a crime. Prosecutors sent the rest of the cases back to the CIA to handle internally, meaning few faced any consequences beyond the possible loss of their jobs and security clearances. These people, they're evil. It also says one employee had sexual contact with a two-year-old and a six-year-old. He was fired. A second employee purchased three sexually explicit videos of young girls filmed by their own mothers. He resigned. A third employee estimated that he had viewed up to 1,400 sexually abusive images of children while on agency assignments. The records do not say what action, if any, the CIA took against him. A contractor who arranged for sex with an undercover FBI agent posing as a child had his contract revoked and only one of the individuals cited in these documents was ever charged with a crime. How? How is this possible? Today was just another chapter in the long history of Alex Jones was right. There's an attack on the species by a guild of psychopaths and they must be defeated. I watched Alec Baldwin with George Snuffleupagus. He is definitely the freak of the week for what he said in this interview. I said certified freak. Seven days a week. Alec Baldwin says he didn't pull the trigger in the shooting that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. That's right, I forgot. Gun control advocates believe guns go off by themselves to kill people. You know, just like cars driving to Christmas parades by themselves, right? In my opinion, you're an idiot. I think the only reason that he must be willing to say something so brazenly stupid is because they don't have video of it. So he's just gonna claim it wasn't me. Call it a day, even though multiple witnesses say otherwise, but you know, the leftist media mob will protect him. Another day, another cover up by the political left. They'll, they'll lure you in, okay? And they'll be really, really lovable until they can get you. And it's, it's a game to them. Another I have to fly to Florida today for a special event with our amazing donors of Turning Point USA, so I can't film an episode for Monday's show. However, we will still put out usual fun content. Plus, with the Dobbs Supreme Court case in the news this week and abortion on everyone's mind, I have a very special and unique guest on The Spillover today. Her name is Melissa Odin, and she is an abortion survivor. Her chilling episode is out now. And for those of you who will start Christmas shopping this weekend, we got brand new politics merch up on shoptpusa.com a hoodie and matching sweatpants. The pants have a drawstring, which I love, so if you're like me and you have no butt, they'll stay up. It's also been cute to see that you guys have been loving all the Poplitics stickers for sale. $4 each and the perfect stocking stuffers. I've seen our graphic design team has been working on more too. Like this episode, click save. Also, I'm curious, what type of content are you consuming the most right now on social media? Is it podcast? Reels, TikToks, Instagram stories. Let me know what you find yourself watching or interacting with the most. DM this episode to two pro-life friends. Tell them to save that abortion pill reversal number to their phone in case someone they know ever needs it. We're back Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. It's pop culture without the propaganda every single day. I'm Alex Clark, and this is Poplitics. Support Poplitics, the first ever conservative pop culture daily show by subscribing to our channel, turning on notifications, and of course, hitting the thumbs up. Also, our main home is on Instagram. Seriously, just trust me, that's where the real magic happens. Follow us there at Poplitics.